Now, here we go. Good. Um, the meeting of the Miramar City Commission is now called to order. May I have the roll call, please? Mayor Messam? Here. Vice Mayor Riggs? Here. Commissioner Chambers? Here. Commissioner Colburn? Here. City Manager Woods Richardson? Here. City Attorney Cole? Here. City Attorney Smith? Here. Let's all rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well, first of all, welcome back and happy belated new year to 2016. We have a couple of proclamations we would like to present. At this time, I'd like to call our chief, is it chief information, chief, chief of marketing. So that's our, our, our formal title now, chief of marketing, Natasha Hampton. Um, who will be accepting the proclamation designating February Black History Month, February 2016. Whereas in 1926, African-American scholar Carter Godwin Woodson organized the first Negro History Week to focus attention on aspects of the black experience in the United States. And whereas Mr. Woodson chose February to coincide with the birthdays of Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln as well as the anniversary of the founding of the NAACP. And whereas renamed Black History Week in 1972, the observance was extended to become Black History Month in 1976. And whereas during February, lectures, ex exhibitions, cultural events, and television and radio programs celebrate the achievements of African Americans. And whereas since 1978, the United States Postal Service has participated in Black History Month by issuing commemorative stamps honoring notable African Americans. Now, therefore, I, Wayne M. Messa, Mayor of the City of Miramar, and on behalf of the City Commission, do hereby proclaim February 2016 as Black History Month in the City of Miramar, and I encourage all citizens to recognize and honor African Americans in celebrating their achievements and their heritage. Next, we have a very special proclamation in honor of one of our very own. And at this time, I would like to ask the immediate past Chief of Police, Raymond Black, to come forward. And I can ask my colleagues to come, come, come forward with me. This proclamation, Chief Police Raymond Black, January 27, 2016. We're going to designate today Chief Raymond Black Day. Whereas, whereas Chief Black began his law enforcement affiliation with the city of Miramar as a police explorer from 1977 through 1980. And whereas, that means as soon as he came out of the womb, he became an explorer. <laughs> whereas, after completing his military service, Chief Black returned to the city of Myanmar and was hired as a police officer on January 9th in 1986. And whereas, during his 30 years of dedicated service, 
Chief Black worked in various assignments, receiving numerous commendations and achieving the rank of Sergeant, Captain, Major, Assistant Chief, and was appointed as Chief of Police on March 6, 2013. And whereas Chief Black attended the 119th session of the Broward County Police Academy, is a graduate of the 2006 session of the FBI National Academy, has earned an associate's degree in criminal justice from Broward College, a bachelor's degree in political science from Florida Atlantic University, and a master's in public administration from Nova Southeastern University. And whereas Chief Black played an integral role in the design of our new police headquarters building being constructed at the Miramar Town Center, and he has to come back when we do our ribbon cutting for that facility. Whereas he describes his tenure as police chief as a distinct honor and takes great pride in the efforts of his team, whom he considers an outstanding organization comprised of dedicated men and women committed to protecting and enhancing the lives of others. And whereas on January 14, 2016, Chief Black retired from the city of Myanmar Police Department after 30 years of outstanding service. Now therefore, I, Wayne Amessa, Mayor of the City of Myanmar, and on behalf of the City Commission, do hereby express gratitude and heartfelt appreciation for Chief's exemplary commitment and dedication to the City of Myanmar. Thank you so much, sir, for your many years of service and dedication and commitment to this community. Now at this time, we'll, we'll um, provide an opportunity for um, Chief Black to provide a, a few uh, words to, I'm sure he has a message for everyone tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Mayor, uh, <clears throat> Commission, City Manager. Thank you so much. I'm honored that you took some time out of your busy schedule tonight to recognize, um, and, uh, and I, recognize me. But I have a lot of people to thank. I've had a lot of afforded opportunities. I've been around with the city obviously a long time. This city for the last 30 years has been a city that many others have wanted to live here, they wanted to work here. I'm proud to be a part of the city, to what city of Miramar has become past, present. You have a great future here. I had a lot of support. Uh, I want to thank uh, my family. Obviously, you can't do this without support from home. Uh, my two children are away, one's in college, to watch on the internet. Hi guys, hi Shane, hey Ryan. And from the day I went to the police academy till tonight, I've been blessed and honored to have the same lady with me, my wife, lovely wife June, who's here tonight. Thank you so much, June, for your support. I wish you all the very best. Good luck. And I'd be honored to come back for the grand opening of the new police station if Dexter gives me the invitation. Thank you. <laughs> We have a, a couple of things that we wanted to say uh, to, the, um, to Chief Black. Um, we can't say those here. We'll say those later. But we do want him to walk away with a couple of other things in his hand. So if you'll step over this way for me, please. This lovely gem is the closest we could get to a badge. It reads, Chief Ray Black, 30 years of service, 1986 to 2016. And gratitude for your, your service and with heartfelt appreciation for your exemplary commitment and dedication to the City of Miramar Police Department. We want to thank you for everything you've done for this city. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Someone wrote that 
the gift of retirement for retirement is the retirement itself, not the watch. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, I mean, I'm going to be upfront with you. This is not a gold watch because you know we do have a budget. <laughs> <laughs> but you act like it's gold because that's the way we feel about you. So you get this watch, and, and, and every time you look at the time, you think about the fact that you don't have to come here anymore. <laughs> And this box, you get to hold it. We know that you have a lot of plans for your retirement, and we think that we have included everything that you should need for retirement in this box. So this box contains uh, things for you to work. We know you're going to do some construction, so there's a nice Home Depot little container there that's going to take care of that. And uh, just literally everything. Most of all, we want you to know that every time you look at this box, you won't help but remember the city of Myanmar. You'll get that later. But that's for you, and we, we wish you a, a, a healthy, a happy retirement. Thank you so much. <laughs> I, I want to thank Ray. Ray was the greatest part of the job, that, the greatest fear that I have in taking this job. And I'm going to just tell you, because I never could tell him before, but the first time I met him at the reception they were holding for uh, the, the recruits for this, this, uh, this position, he and, and Chief Coons, uh, the fire chief, stepped up to me, and, and Fred literally did all the talking, and this one didn't say anything, and I walked away thinking, like, God, I'm going to have trouble with that one. <laughs> <laughs> and he has been really, literally a pleasure to work with, so I want to thank you. I do have something for you here. You get this brown bag. June, if you'd come up, please. I'm glad you were up because I had no authority. <laughs> <laughs> the gift is for June. <laughs> Ray is a very honest man, and you heard him talk about the fact that he needed her to get this done. Um, he has said that in the past, that he couldn't have done it without her. And for that reason, we know the sacrifice it takes for public service. And we know that the kind of work that you did, that you gave more than most people would have or could have. And so for that, we're grateful not just to you, but for her. He's even said that she raised the children. <laughs> and I understand they're great boys, so she did a great job. So for that reason, we can't give her back the time that she didn't have you at home, but we can give her something that... Um, for those times you are home, in addition to the honeydews list that you got to take care out of this box. This is something for June, for June, and Ray's name is on it, but it's actually an obligation for him to pay you back for some of the time he missed at home. Thank you. You'll Thank you. enjoy that. <laughs> Uh, Ray, we have one more parting shot, I mean gift for you. <laughs> this is your special. Before we go into um, public comments, I do want to recognize some special visitors we have today, and that is the Miramar Youth Advisory Council. If I can ask them to all please stand, give them a round of applause. Thank you.
7.30 is the designated time for public comments. This is after that's um, 7.30. We will now um, have um, public comments. Um, there was a sheet that has been made available for those members of the public who would like to speak. Should have signed up. Um, we have a few house rules in terms of public comment. We ask that when you come to the podium, if you would state your name clearly and your address, and you have three minutes to address um, the commission. And um, we would like to ask um, the audience um, that um, we are respectful during the public comment process. And if you either like or support what is being said, we ask that you um, give all the praise and cheers that you want silently. And our accepted universal signal is you can give them a jolly praise if you support. So we can be respectful in the process. Um, currently, right now, um, first on the list is Bill Steers. Yes, sir. Next on the list is Carolyn Steers. If you're passing time, if you could still state your name and your address for the record. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, my name is Carolyn Steers, address 3580 Southwest 68th Terrace, Miramar, and I'd like to give my time to Greg McQueen. Thank you. Thank you. You say you can't give your time away. Um, Rena McQueen, Reva McQueen. I don't know. And if you're scheduled to talk, if you can move to the front row so that we can know who all is sex, um, scheduled to, to talk. Good evening. My name is Renee McQueen, 3581 Southwest 68 Terrace. And I give my minutes to Craig McQueen. Thank All right, thank you. Ephraim Colazzo. Ephraim Colazzo, 6860 Southwest 36th Street. I'm also giving my time to Mr. McQueen. All right, Mr. Um, Craig McQueen. Um, before you um, sp speak, Mr. Mr. McQueen, um, there have been there have been uh, members from the public, residents who have stated their name and their address, um, um, requesting to give their time to. Um, it, it's it's not a procedure that we <laughs> grant. So if you could, um, would, obviously it's an important me, issue. So time. if you can just, I won't use all their time. Yeah, state state your time. Okay. Um, state state your issue. I'm for, for the Commission for Public Comment. Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Craig McQueen. My address is 3581 Southwest 68 Terrace. I've been a resident of Miramar since 1989. Uh, we're here to speak regarding to Ordinance 2048 as it relates to parking and cul-de-sacs. Uh, that's a serious concern that I'd like to discuss with you. And before I get started, so you can follow along with me, if I could pass something to either end as photos and stuff of that nature, if I'm permitted to do that. We well, can just pass it to the, the clerk and she'll disseminate it. As stated, uh, I live at 3581 Southwest 68 Terrace, which is a cul-de-sac. And as the photos will come around, you will see 
It's a typical cul-de-sac in Miramar. We have four houses on our cul-de-sac, and the two end houses has swells, and the two middle houses, there's no swells. So anytime there's an overflow, where can people park? They actually park in the cul-de-sac. Since I've been a resident since 1989, I've always had a car in the cul-de-sac. It's never been an issue. Never once a problem, because as the ordinance states, 2048, it states clearly on letter D, which you will get once you get the packages, it states that parking, parking in public right of way, it shall be prohibited for any person to park in any, park any vehicle, any street, to impede the flow of traffic or to interfere with emergency vehicles. And when you go to letter K, letter K speaks about the blocking of someone's driveway. But it never talks about you not being able to use the cul-de-sac. It says that you cannot violate that particular part of the ordinance. And the ordinance clearly states you can't block anybody's driveway. You can't block anyone uh, from coming in and out of the cul-de-sacs. And we all know cul-de-sacs are a little, uh, a little bit unique because they are uh, dead ends with a circle. People can come in and get out and people do have that luxury to come in and get out. Our daytime traffic in our cul-de-sac consists of two uh, groups of people. Once you see the package, if you go to number two, you see it's our postal service. They come in every day, come to our cul-de-sac, they go in without any issue. The second will be our bi-weekly refuse pickup, which is from Waste Pro. They come into our cul-de-sac, they get the trash, they get the recycling without any issues. We have not had any issues. When I moved in in 1989, we had two other neighbors move in, 1997 and again 1998, respectively. And so from 1997 all the way to 2013, our cul-de-sac was unknown because people enjoyed parking in the cul-de-sac when necessary. Our neighbors, the ones who gave me their time, whenever there's a family gathering, people get with each other and say, hey, look, I'm having a little function at my house. We're going to make sure that your driveway is not blocked. Let me know if there's a problem. There's never been a problem. If you go real quickly, and I know this is buzzing, just mm -hmm. give me indulge with me just for a moment. If you go to item number three, in 2013 slash 2014, when all of this problem started, if you look at item three for me, please. Item three is a report from the city of Miramar Code Enforcement, and it lists code violations. The code violations are listed for address 3591, which is 77 pages of documentation of code violations. 77 pages. This is from your report. My address is the next address, 3581. It shows zero. That's where all this started. This particular neighbor got upset because he began to get cited for code and violation of his own fruition. This is his issues. No one called on him but he made it seem like it's now a neighborhood issue. And what did he start to do? He began to call and complain against the neighbors for everything. If you go to item three and four, he started calling about the trees. He called so much about the tree that the city, you had to hire a tree expert, an arborist, and it states in the report, Ms. Patricia Hoot, to come out and look at the trees. You pay for that, and we all pay for it. And they stated clearly that the trees are not a problem, they're within code, and these same trees, if we keep trimming them, then we may damage the trees. You pay for that. Then it went from that to the sidewalks and the stains on the sidewalk, as you look in the pictures. No stains on the sidewalks. The only stain that there is on the sidewalk is in front of where? 3591. That's where the violations are at. We moved further. It became a problem when he could not get the tree issue done, or the sidewalk, or the trash can started calling about the trash cans being in the cul-de-sac. Again, the city came out and said, well, there's no swells. Where do the people put their trash cans? You have to put it in the cul-de-sac. But you make sure that no one driveway is blocked. No one driveway was blocked. And in the report, which states, which is in your package, the only person <laughs> that they saw dry, uh, trash cans in the cul-de-sac at the time that they inspected it was who? 3591. And then from that, it went to, let's start complaining about parking. So items four all the way through is issues of parking. And the police department was called over 25 times regarding to parking. And each time, the police officers noted in their report, which you have in your package, items 4A, 4C, 4B, that no driveway was blocked, no impeding of vehicles was blocked, that this person just started calling about parking in the cul-de-sac and wanted to use 
ordinance 2048 as his method to stop people from parking in the cul-de-sac. It became such an irritant that the police department finally said, no one can park in the cul-de-sac. No one can park in the cul-de-sac because of a complaint of one person. And that's not fair. M Mr. McQueen, if yeah. you can make your okay, um, request wrap it up, so we okay, can wrap it up. Real quickly, lastly, 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 before I wrap it up, please thank you for indulging me, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, council people and commissioners. It went to a point to where the person began to start approaching people about parking in the cul-de-sac, which is very dangerous. And I, and I warned the police department that that needs to stop. And they did. They took action. They told him, you cannot go and start telling people they can't park in the cul-de-sac. He went to a person who was parking in the cul-de-sac and told him, if you park here, a crazy neighbor's going to call the police on you. And when the person, we asked him to describe the person, it described himself. So that's his own self-identification. Self, uh, in, the, in, the, in your package also is a code enforcement report that stated Mr. Nicholson is now going to several addresses and now taking pictures of folks' homes looking for code for violations. So since the parking thing is now becoming a problem and he can't have his way, he's now going through the neighborhood taking pictures of people's homes. This is in the report from the code enforcement officer. What we're asking, very simple, very simple of you all, please. We want a complete review and a quick review of code 2048. We think the ordinance itself stands as it is. It doesn't prohibit people from parking in the cul-de-sac and using the space that those cul-de-sacs are designed. And I can tell you, anyone that ever, and if you live in a cul-de-sac, people don't buy a cul-de-sac and say, oh, we can't use the space. Everyone has used that space. But the ordinance sh should be implied the way it's written. It should be implied that where the elements of the ordinance, it's what dictate the actions from our law enforcement. If someone's driveway is blocked, then yes, no, write them a ticket if someone's driveway is blocked. If an emergency vehicle can't come through, and I, I haven't heard anyone from the fire department that posts a solid waste to say they can't get into the call de sacs No emergency vehicle drives through the call de sac and expect you can go but one way, you make the loop, the loop, and you got pictures of that. So what we're asking for is simple, please. Look at the ordinance, let the punishment of the ordinance stand, and let the residents who have been parking in their cul-de-sac all of these years be allowed to continue to do something. And, you, if, and, you, if someone, and if someone violates it, then please enforce it. But to just to arbitrarily say no one can park because one person has decided to make it a neighborhood issue to go around and complain about everybody parking in Thank you, Mr. McQueen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, mm. Next is Mr. Robert Nicholson. Good evening, Mr. Good evening, Mayor, sir. Uh, commissioners. Robert Nicholson, 3591 Southwest 68 Terrace. I echo the sentiments that it was just made. Uh, please do review that uh, cul-de-sac parking. This issue was never about cul-de-sac uh, parking. This issue was about blocking my driveway with garbage cans and vehicles. As the police reports will show that each one of the police that have been to the cul-de-sac, they have noted that. I would like to also address the issue of being fair and equitable. Um, I received a letter from um, code enforcement through Major Levine. It stated that the tree which initially started this, this rigmarole, um, that the tree is a hazard. And as you saw today throughout day, uh, through Broward County, there were several trees that toppled over because she states, Ms. Hoop states in here that the tree is a hazard. Okay, this is what initially started all this. Every time there's a, uh, something, something that transpires with this person, something is done. If you go to the residence right now, you'll see that there are 300 watt bulbs shining in my windows of my house. Okay. Uh, also, I would like to address the uh, trespassing. On July 2nd, 2013, when this all initially started, there was a statement made about both were explained about trespassing. This person trespassed on my property twice a week, okay? And I need the law to be fair. It took them 15 months to finally come out and cite this person for parking and blocking my driveway. 
in the cul-de-sac. Also, um, like I say, 15, 15 months to, uh, to, uh, to cite him. There are other issues that have been, I have never approached anyone about parking. The residents of, of Miramar, East Miramar, were sent this. This is not about parking. This is not about parking in the cul-de-sac. This is about blocking my driveway and continuously harassing me. I, we have wonderful officers here. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to leave them tonight with a video. I'm going to give it to the head, and I want them to decide uh, who's in violation. All I want to do is live in my house peacefully. Each day, each time something happens, I have code enforcement. I've got a little rust stain on my house. She cites me. The video will show where she came to the, to the, um, to the area there, and she made, uh, I mean, the video shows 40, 50, 60 minutes of lollygagging out in the cul-de-sac. Come to the cul-de-sac, do your job, leave. All this playing around, and like I say, the video is so long, it's divided into two parts. I would also like to say that um, we have wonderful officers. Uh, they have supported me, and I give praise to all of them. But I want them to be fair. I got to get four reports to do this. I got to get five reports to do that. When is it going to stop? This person that, that made the claim, uh, I want, like I say, I want them to be fair. Because he's a law enforcement officer with the city of Miami, he is not above the law. And it seems to be that's what's going on. We're showing favoritism with the code enforcement and with some of the officers. I had to get four police reports. One officer came out and that person said, she looked at the car and she said, oh, what do you want me to do? You want me to cite? I say, if that's what you're supposed to do, cite it. She said, oh, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't uh, cite that car. Why can't she cite the car? That's like me going to school and telling the kids, I can't teach you today. You know, we need to be fair. We need to do our job. If, if a police officer uh, violates the law, he needs to pay for it. Let's be fair and equitable here. That's all I'm asking. All I want to do is live in my house peacefully. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nicholson. Um, typically during uh, public comments, we um, reserve comments, but this is an issue that um, the city administration and, and maybe even perhaps some of the commission members are, um, or at least I'm aware of this issue and that um, internally um, um, we're working to, um, to respond with a solution regarding um, the, um, the issues that have been raised tonight and yes, that, and that um, our, you, all, you both will be contacted in terms of um, what will be the next step. Um, obviously, this is not the forum to solve exactly. um, the issue um, between um, two neighbors, but we do appreciate both of you um, taking advantage of the public forum process to communicate um, your position. So um, respectfully thank um, both of you for um, coming forward tonight. Thank um, you Mr. For Roland you. Abel. Roll and Abel, 7606 Harbor Boulevard. And um, hopefully I'm bringing much brighter news to the chambers tonight. Good evening. Um, the, tree, the lighting of Fairway Park. And I would, you know, normally we come and we complain, and I think it's only fair that when something is done and done well, that we should come and acknowledge and appreciate. Um, I don't know how many persons have had the opportunity to drive by that park um, when the lights are on. And I believe it is probably the best lit and the most beautiful park at night in the city of Miramar. And I, the only problem is that others, when they come by, they are going to be pressuring that their parks look like ours. <laughs> but we really, really, truly appreciate it. I'm not quite sure which department was responsible, but it is absolutely beautiful. And I think I just need to say that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Abel. <laughs> Mayor Rayner. 
Good evening. Good evening. Okay, there's just um, there's State three. Your name and address, oh, I'm sorry. For the record. Mary Rayner, 6100 Southwest 21st Street. Okay, um, there's three different issues I want to bring to your attention. First of all, we are now charging a two percent charge on the credit card payments that will be effective, I guess, as of March 1st. Um, first of all, that was included in with our budget. So why now are we charging the two percent? I believe that would be called double dipping. So that's something that needs to be looked into. I've gotten many, many calls about that this week. Okay, public safety is most important for our residents. Why on the east side our substation has been delayed for approximately two years? The Civic Center is not being used. I understand that the PAL facility has been torn down. I want to know why um, this has been put on a delay okay of two years okay also some of our employees are sort of overlooked on higher positions okay some people are just put in the position um, you know without uh, seniority or anything like that something has got to be done to be treating our employees fairly because it's not being done now okay thank you thank you Seeing no other, seeing no other public, any of the members from the public signed in, um, we are now closing public comments. Um, we thank everyone for their participation in this process. We're now on the consent agenda. Items listed under consent agenda are viewed to be routine and the recommendation will be enacted by one motion in the form listed below. If discussion is desired, the items will be removed from the consent agenda and will be considered separately. Anyone wishing to comment on any item on the consent agenda should approach the podium now. Seeing none. Are there any items wishing, any commissioners wishing to pull any items on the consent agenda? If you can state the, the numbers, please. Commissioner Colburn, I'll work my way down. Commissioner Colburn, any? Uh, item number six, eight, and 11. Commissioner Chambers. Item number seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, um, 12, and um, 13. Business first presentation. Business first presentation. There's a business. This? What do you want? The business first presentation. Yeah. Okay. I forgot. Okay. Vice Mayor? Twelve. Twelve. And I also had two and eight. So just so I'm clear, it's two, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and twelve. That captures everyone's? And thirteen? All right, thirteen. Can I have a motion on the balance of the consent agenda? Motion to approve. Second. Call the roll. Commissioner Chambers? Yes. Commissioner Colburn? Yes. Vice Mayor Riggs? Yes. Mayor Massam? Yes. Um, before we go down into the, um, the items that were pulled out of consent agenda, I did omit a presentation by Business First survey results by PMG Associates. So I do want to take the opportunity to bring them forward so they can um, give um, the presentation prior to us going to um, the agenda. I apologize for that omission.
Good evening, Mayor and Commission. My name is Phil Gonot with uh, PMG Associates. Uh, we, are, we conducted the study uh, for Business First. Uh, just to let you know, Business First was, was modeled after a program in the city of Fort Lauderdale between the city and the Chamber of Commerce to look at measuring the business climate in that community. And that was our, our point. Uh, the methodology was actually threefold. First was a survey of businesses across the city. These were anonymous. We made sure that their, their answers were, were kept uh, confidential. Uh, we used a series of data sources, some private sources that we have, as well as the business licenses that are available in the city. And we distributed it uh, approach, uh, proportionally across the city. Uh, using the planning districts of an east, uh, central, and a west, we made sure that every area was covered from that pro rata basis and also made sure that all industries were covered. The second part of it was the focus groups. We held three focus groups. The first uh, included businesses primarily from the western part of the city and some of the larger biz businesses. The second one was limited only to those people from the historic portion of this town, the eastern part. And so they were had direct uh, contact for this. And the third one was members of the Economic Development Board and the Planning and Zoning Board. And basically what we discussed with them was the results of the previous two focus groups. And then the reports and recommendations there. The distributions of the survey were, again, were proportional based on the number of businesses in each portion of the city. And this is just generally, you see the, the uh, designation of the West, Central, and East area. And also the categories, we covered all range of those businesses that have, are available in the city. Some of the facts that include, and one of the things that we have here too, is some national statistics or local ones that you could compare with. Uh, most of them were smaller business, the sole location, 76% which compares nationally to 86% of them. 75% uh, of them were less than 2,500 square feet. Uh, most of them, or 34%, were in no longer in business longer than 10 years. So they've been here for a while and part of the community. One of the things we looked at was the number of employees per company. And you see that the employees per company in Miramar was 13.7, which is higher than the entirety of Broward County, but a little bit less than what the national average is. Most of them rented their spaces. And also there was a question about recruiting personnel, which seems, as you could tell here with a percentage, a national trend. It's not something here locally. But the good part is 44% of the people live in the city. That means they are a part of this community, not just doing business here, but living and raising their families here. The real good news is the image of the, of the city was very favorable. 87% of the respondents had a very favorable or very favorable view of the city. And very, most of them would recommend this city as a place to do business to others in their industry. So they were very, very important to bring them into this particular community. One of the things we want to look at was how well businesses were doing in the last several years. Again, this is post-recession. So we're looking at how they're doing now, how they recovered. But you see in terms of the two that are highlighted there, those that are positive, their business has increased, is significantly more than those that have seen a decrease. So that way the business community at large is on the upswing. And that's an important role for you all as well. For the next two years, where again, we asked about how they're going, where they're looking at. A number of firms, 23%, are looking to expand, grow, add room, hire employees. And again, that is something that we think is hugely important. Only 2% are planning a reduction. A number of people are looking about moving outside of the city, but the main reason is consolidation of some of their other businesses. They have uh, a place in Miami-Dade County, for example, and they're trying to consolidate. But if you look at the point of 12% that are either going to reduce or move, twice as many are going to grow. 
And again, because you go through cycles, businesses go down, but the fact that most of them are on the way up is a better point. 40% of the businesses are looking to hire new employees. And for that group, it's about 3.85 per business of full-time employees, which generates about 3,700 new full-time jobs in the city, and about 2,300 part-time jobs with these businesses. Again, that's something that's on the rise, which we think is very important. Now, with the focus groups, one of the things is we had an advantage, as you probably all know, uh, Stella Tokar, that was with the Chamber of Commerce, now has her own consulting firm. She volunteered and worked with us to facilitate the focus groups. So with someone from the neighborhood, someone from the city that participated in that. And again, we asked a number of questions. What's the image of the city? What can the city do for your business? But one of the things very important is what can you do working with the city to improve business? Because the idea is a partnership. The image was very favorable. And on the west side, there's a lot of Class A uh, office space, which gives a good image. There's a cluster of employment centers, including high-tech industries in this city. And that there's something, again, which will help for, uh, for networking and expanding the opportunities. The historic part of Miramar has a long history. One of the reasons I know that as well is I grew up there. I actually went to school at St. Stephen's. Uh, Mary Rayner is involved. I actually went to school with my brother. So we know this community, and we know how well those people have been working together to help build businesses. There were some negative issues. One is that there's no real plan for the east side uh, of town, the historic area. And that there are issues that we're seeing in terms of incentive programs and some others, which really boils down to an issue of communication. Not all the businesses know what is available to them. And so what we need to do is expand that particular point. There is some question in terms of the building uh, department and getting permits to expand. And again, I think it's because they're not really know the process. And there are some plans to address that we'll address in just a moment here. But the next steps is a mission plan. This is what we're going to do to look at a, a tri-party type of issue with the city, the Chamber of Commerce, and the business community to work together in terms of the communication and how to build a better economic uh, viability here. One of the important parts is the communication. Several of the businesses, the large businesses, offered to help with a consortium and mentor some of the smaller businesses. It was their suggestion to do that. And I think that's something that you cannot let go. If these people who have been very successful want to volunteer their time, I think the city needs to take them up on that. But you are now in a process, you've just let out a contract just recently to develop an economic development program. The materials we have here are not contrary to anything. It's supplemental background information which we think is going to help them. So these types of things, of developing the mission plan, develop a business advocate who isn't necessarily another staff person. It could be a volunteer person, something out of the, the chamber, or some of this consortium of these groups and mentoring work together, so that these small businesses can get somebody to answer their questions and help them do business in this city. These are what we are looking for, is to build that process. And again, I think that when they all work together, the city is not responsible for paying all these particular issues out, but to facilitate this issue, to bring together these people who have said on their own they are willing to, to help and support. And through this combination of efforts, I think you can expand the economic growth of the city and add jobs to the people who live there. That's our report. It's informational, but I'm glad to answer any questions you may have. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Gannat. Yes, it is. Thank you, Mr. Gannat, for your um, presentation. I did have a, a quick question. Um, 
obviously this report will be pro will be provided to the um, to the commission. Yes. And um, in in terms of your data that was um, presented, obviously it was comprehensive collective of all all businesses in the city. Um, um, I'm looking forward to see how the demographics break out in terms of um, your data points to see how businesses are doing in the east, central, and west so that, you know, comprehensively it could be a 70% success on the west but 10% in the east but when you get the, the average, you know, collectively it doesn't necessarily, you know, point out um, where it is, but as the city as a whole, these are some good good data to show that the city of Myanmar continues to be a strong um, place to do business and continues to grow. However, we definitely want to be able to use this information to be able to enhance and support um, the businesses that may not necessarily be faring well. Um, and um, and I think that some of the perceptions that you have pointed out are spot on in terms of what people our business owners perceive in the city and obviously there there are some resources that are available if they only knew about them and there's obviously some areas of opportunity that the city can take to be able to communicate what resources are out and any resources that aren't effective we need to revisit them and see how we can make them more uh, more more effective and as you noted um, the city is currently through the community and economic development department is undergoing um, a economic development plan um, right now um, to address many issues specifically in our historic um, side of town so as we as a commission look and explore options to see um, how we can um, um, incentivize as well as kickstart you know um, um, economic even more economic development um, in the historic side of town. So um, are there any questions um, from the commission for the presentation? Okay. But thank uh, you so, so much for you your report. You Mayor, what I gave you was citywide numbers here, mm -hmm. but each of those geographic areas, that is in the report as well. Okay. Thank you, thank you so much. All right, item number two, please. We're ready for the... I just want to confirm that a vote was taken on the rest. It was taken. Okay. Yes, it was taken. Right, item number two is a resolution of the City Commission, City of Miramar, Florida, approving and adopting the planning document preliminary design report for the East Water Treatment Plant renovation project pursuant to Chapter 62552 of the Florida Administrative Code and finding an effective date. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Commission, City Manager, Hong Kong Director of Utilities. Would you like to see the full presentation or have some comments? Um, no, I don't have. I pulled this item. Um, I don't have a full presentation. Uh, I don't request um, for this, but um, I would like, though, however, for you to just to give a summary um, for um, this item with the East West. Um, but the East Water Treatment Plant renovation projects, just so that our neighbors, because um, um, as often as said that um, that um, a lot of emphasis is not being made into the East, and I just want to communicate to the residents that um, of, a, of an exciting project that is taking place on the east side of town, town that is directly impact, that will directly impact um, the residents and businesses on the east side of Miramar. Understood. Um, as you all know, the East Water Plant um, was built in 1950s and it used to be the one and only water plant support, supply water to the entire city of Miramar. Throughout those years, um, East Water Plant has gone through several uh, renovations and rehabilitations, and to this date, it's already gone beyond the useful life. And it's about the time to completely re-renovate this uh, um, water plant. And as you heard, you know, East Side has gone through um, economic redevelopment, and this is a very fundamental piece of the redevelopment. Without a water plant um, firm capacity, the redevelopment is not going to happen. So um, we planned, uh, designed, 
this water plant, and as you know, um, city commission just approved the design build contract um, very recently. And this planning document is part of the requirement per um, Chapter 62552 State Drinking Water Revolving Fund Program. The city commission is required to formally adopt the planning document, just to show your commitment to support this project in order for the state to uh, provide funding. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, DEP just hold a um, public hearing um, January 20th. This project was on the funding list. We were approved up to $23.7 million for the revolving loan um, funding to pay for this construction project. And it's a low interest loan, and um, current uh, resetting already include any uh, anticipated construction costs to pay for the debt service of this project. So in another word, um, it will be it will not be another rate adjustment or increase. It will be no user impact for the uh, rate payers. So the current resetting will be sufficient to pay all the debt service. And once uh, the project um, complete, the water plant will no longer use lime softening. It will be converted to the membrane softening process, which is the same uh, process as we use at the wastewater plant. And uh, that will enhance the reliability and um, improve the operation efficiency and uh, also make the water uh, quality consistent from east and west. And uh, once we are done, it's going to have a firm capacity of 6 MGD. And in the meantime, we are, um, we finished, the, um, we complete the um, permit modification uh, working with the district. So the permit is right now in the draft um, stage. So we're soon going to receive um, consumption use permit that include increased allocation from this King Aquifer to support for this uh, renovation project because uh, um, converting from lime softening to membrane softening, we are losing more water because lime softening, we only lose less than 10 percent of water due to the treatment. Uh, when we convert to the um, membrane softening, we're going to lose 20 percent through the treatment process. So we need a more allocation. Part of the requirement um, as part of the uh, permit uh, negotiation with the district is for city to um, expand the reclaimed water system. We're going to bring that project to the commission for approval very soon because um, per the uh, water availability rule, the city is required to um, explore alternative water source for any additional uh, needs um, if, you know, compared to the 2006 Six. usage, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's basically in a nutshell of this project and the city commission's approval. I mean, this agenda is just seeking city commission's approval for the planning document, and we will come back to the city commission for approval for construction um, of this project. What's the, con the anticipated construction schedule for when this project the, to be completed? Uh, the the project right now is in the design phase. Mm -hmm. By the end of this year, we should have a, a full contract um, firm construction cost and come back to the commission for approval. The construction going to take two years. Mm -hmm. okay. So in essence, on the east, they will have a newer, a new, basically brand new water treatment plant with clean, fresh water, even with at least newer technology than the West treatment plant. It's the same, but Correct. new components. Correct. Okay. And, and the reason why this is so important is because when you're talking about economic development, redeveloping our historic side of town, you have to have infrastructure in place. So now when developers are looking at potential investment opportunities, knowing that the city is building a brand new or renovate or totally renovating its water treatment facility, they can develop their projects with the confidence that they have high grade quality water and they can market that to their potential property buyers as well as tenants. And this is very key in terms of um, investment. And finally, um, the financing mechanism, due to the fact that utilities is an enterprise fund, it operates totally and separate from the general fund. Is that's where the taxpayers pay taxes to operate um, any operational costs for the city. They, 
the utilities is an enterprise fund, and it operates solely within the resources that it generates from producing water supply as well as fees it charges for, for sewer. And using the state revolving loan program is absolutely the most fiscally responsible way to financing these um, um, expensive projects because it's going to cost us over $20 million for us to renovate this facility. But the uh, final construction cost is in the development stage, and uh, we anticipate we're going to be much lower than the $20 okay, million. Okay, good. Dollars. That's even better. Uh, right. Even and, better. And, but we are approved up to $20 up to tw $20 exactly. million. Dollars. But the actual uh, contract, I mean, the final okay. uh, agreement uh, for the loan will be based on the actual construction cost. Okay, great. Are there any questions? Commissioner Chambers, you're recognized. Good evening, Director Hahn. How are you? Good. Good. Um, this has been one of my biggest concerns um, before I was re before I got re elected here. Um, I'm very happy and excited that we're moving forward, trying to get this done. And I wanted to commend um, the utility worker, you and your staff, and the people in the trenches, 24 hours, trying to keep that uh, water plant going and providing us with uh, safe drinking water. Um, even though it's an older plant, the water is better than the bottled water, um, and I'm truly mean that it is. So, it, and it's not an easy task to keep that plant going. It's, it's there's some work. So, I want to commend you and um, the men and women that are in the trenches keeping it going for the work to that water plant. However, I'm still a little disappointed that when we had the opportunity to build that water plant for cash, we didn't uh, do it at the time. Um, even with the reserve that we had and with the uh, 60 million that we borrowed, we still didn't do it. I don't want to keep going back there, but we where we are now, and I'm hoping that we can bring the cost down. That's going to be an issue for me. I know we're trying to borrow more than what we, well, what we're applying for, more than what we're going to need to build our plant. So um, I'm going to be watching, and I hope we can get it down to where um, a minimum cost. We have to really do diligent and shop and make sure the contractor doesn't overcharge us. So that's, that's well I'm taken. That note is well taken. And uh, we work very closely with the contractor and designer. We try to um, use renovate, um, innovations through the design process. Right. Whatever we can see the possibility to save money, we definitely will do that. And that's why we, uh, our staff is on top of the task. We, we don't let the contractor, let the designer run the project. We were very much involved. That's the reason we select design build. Actually, it's a progressive design build. We're going to work closely with the design engineer and the contractor, making sure uh, we spend the money for the most needed, most effective, and the cost effectively. Right. And I will be forwarding some of my concerns in terms of pricing to you or the city manager. Um, from my understanding, we are borrowing the money, correct? This is a, this, and uh, when we did a um, risk study, um, including this project, it was a kind of balanced with a cash fund and also a borrow money from the SRF. Um, it, it, we, we were not gonna borrow more than we need to borrow. That's for sure. We do have some cash and that we can use, but this is a uh, state revolving loan right now is less than 2%. And we can use our cash for some other needed um, project because a small project doesn't make sense to borrow money. So if we can borrow money for these major improvements, we can free our cash for some other as we go, pay as we go project. Like wow. our vehicle need the replacement. We have some ongoing equipment re replacement. Each one of those could cost like a couple of hundred thousand dollars on annual base. So those kind of needs are gonna be covered by the cash. And uh, we are very healthy and in cash and in the utility financing. And I'm very confident with that. Um, but you know, um, this project, as I said, we were approved up to that amount. So why don't we take advantage for that? What I was trying to get at is that even though we're borrowing the money at a low interest rate, 2%, mm -hmm. I believe, uh, we're going to have to pay it back. It's a lot of money, and it's 2%, and 2% and a lot of money adds up. So I just want okay. the resident to be aware that they're going to have to, uh, it's not a free money we're getting, we're going to have right. to pay it back. 
Okay. Even if it's interest free, we still have to pay the money back. So that's what I was trying to get at. Thank okay. you so much. Okay, thank you. And for clarity, and for clarity, for the residents, that the utility fund is a self-supporting fund and is not supported by the general fund, which the 2013 revenue bond supported capital projects associated in the general fund. So these are two separate funds. There's not funding options that the 2013 revenue bond would not even be in consideration for funding the water treatment plan or any utility asset because it's a separate utility fund. So I just want to be clear so it clears up any misunderstandings in terms of what options the city have in terms of financing projects. And I do commend, as stated earlier, staff for taking a very conservative approach in terms of using financing vehicles to upgrade needed assets in the city without having a deleterious effect in terms of increasing rates um, for our end users, which are our businesses and our residential communities. So I commend staff for that. But I just wanted to uh, make that clarification because it, it comes up a lot on the, on the dais and I just want to make sure that the residents understand that infrastructure improvements that include utilities are totally su supported and funded through um, the ut the, you do utilities um, and utilities fund as a separate enterprise fund. So thank you so much. Thank you. Um, if there aren't any other comments or questions, I entertain a motion. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, I think there's no misunderstanding. I mean, what I clearly ask is that when we, the money that we're going to borrow, we have to pay it back. I understand it's the enterprise fund. The utility is the only thing in the city of Miramar that makes money. We, we generate a lot of money from the water plant. And, and the sewer. So I, it's, it's not a misunderstanding or anything. We know we're borrowing that money to upgrade the water plant and we're going to have to pay it back. It's simple. Thank you. Can I have a motion, please? Motion to approve. Second. Sir. Call the roll. Commissioner Chambers? Yes. Commissioner Colborn? Yes. Vice Mayor Riggs? Yes. Mayor Massa? Yes. Um, item number six. Item six, a resolution of the City Commission of the City of Miramar, Florida, approving the purchase of citywide communication services from Verizon Wireless, utilizing Santa Florida Agreement number DMS 10-11-008-C in an amount not to exceed $267,220 for fiscal year 2016 and providing an effective date. Would you like a presentation, just have a question? Uh, not a full presentation, although that may take less time. <laughs> 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 but um, it, it sounds like it's a, a good, um, that this is a good item, it's a good thing that you're doing. Um, it is a savings from what we have spent the last uh, couple of years, is that correct? Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Madam Vice Mayor, Commissioners, Randy Cross, Procurement Director. The price is, uh, is set on a year basis off the State of Florida contract that we're using, and really it's going to fluctuate based upon uh, the, the usage we have, if we hire new employees or assign new devices to employees or replace new devices. So some years where devices are uh, older or being replaced, they're out of contract, then it might we might spend more money that year above the regular rate that we pay. But uh, over the last year, year and a half, uh, Verizon's worked very closely with us to make sure that wherever we can save money by using plans that are more cost effective for us based on the utilization, they, they direct us in that so that we do try and save as much money as we can so we're not spending for devices that aren't being utilized. If I do understand this item correctly, currently we have several different companies that we're going to, that we're that we receive service from. With this item, we will only have one provider? We, we will continue to use Verizon, AT&T, Sprint, and T-Mobile. We majority, will continue to use several do. others. We do. The okay. majority, the lion's share, about 80% of the lines that we have is on Verizon. OK. And that's, this, this, since this item is above $150,000 for citywide use, it requires commission approval. The other carriers don't get up that high. Okay, so we will continue to use other providers. We're not consolidating. Correct. Okay. Um, the only other question I have, by using the state, uh, the state contract, um, that state contract, it's, what is it, four years old? Um, it, and it if, they renew, if they renew the contract, it would be like 
I guess maybe 10 years. Um, it seems like we get we have new technology all the time, and I'm just wondering: is getting into a contract like that um, has the technology changed in the last four years, or, or you know, even between now and and the next six years? The, the uh, contract, should we be looking yep. at getting a new, <laughs> you know, getting uh, putting it out so that we can see what new technology there is and maybe get better rates? The current contract was awarded by the state in 2010. It expired, I think, in 2015. There's, they're on a renewal right now, which expires in 2017. Okay. Uh, so we have this year to figure out what we're going to do as far as whether or not we'll bid it out or whether or not we'll recommend staying with the state if the state does a new bid or they extend the contract further. The contract does provide for updated lists on a very frequent basis with all the products that are being offered by all the carriers on the contract. So we're not using, we're not purchasing devices that are five years old when the contract was awarded. Each year as the carriers come out with new lines, they update the lines that the, the types of products we're allowed to purchase. So we still get the newest iPads, iPhones, Android devices, air cards, GPS devices. We're still using the latest technology. In fact, their technology on their on their network doesn't really work well with the older tech. So in order to get the best use of the technology and the service, we have to have the newest tech to stay up with that. And this okay. contract allows for that. I did see that they were they were charging for roaming um within the United States or even locally. And, and that concerned me because I thought, you know, under more recent plans, it seemed like that's not, a, that's not usually a charge anymore. Yeah, they're, they're na nationwide providers, so there shouldn't be roaming. If there is a roaming, it might be an issue with the device not picking up the network or something like that. We usually work with them. If we find that, then they'll, they'll usually work with us to reverse those charges and stuff. Usually that only occurs if someone travels outside the country for work, something like that, where we'll have that. As an issue. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Colburn. If there are any other questions, I'll, and you have a question, Commissioner, Commissioner Chambers? You're recognized. It's not a question. I just want to kind of agree with um, Commissioner Colburn. I'm hoping that next time we can look at more saving. Um, I'm really looking forward to you guys try to go out and get more competitive bid and see if we can save some more money. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks, Commissioner Colburn. Um, if there aren't any more comments or questions, I'll entertain a motion for approval. Motion to approve. Second. Call the roll. Commissioner Chambers? Yes. Commissioner Colburn? Yes. Vice Mayor Riggs? Yes. Mayor Messam? Yes. Item number seven, please. Item number seven is Resolution City Commission City of Miramar, Florida, approving the award of invitation for bid number 16-002, entitled Miramar Parkway Berm Landscape Improvements to Arizona Brothers Corporation in an amount of $65,129, authorizing city manager to execute an appropriate agreement with the, with the Arizona Brothers Corporation and providing an effective date. Uh, Grant, good evening to all. Thomas Good, Public Works Director. Um, is there a need to see the presentation or are there questions to the site? Uh, I'm not sure if I need you, Mr. Good, but uh, me pulling this item is more for my colleague. Um, I think this item came about back in 2014, and I think time, a change, and I, I see this item as more of a want than a need, and I was wondering if we could uh, hold off on this project and move this money someplace else that's more needed, um, and because we budget issue that we are facing right now, I, I know for a fact I drive that way every day, and I think this is not a... If we move along with this project, I think we're going to still need to redo it again. Um, uh, so I'm asking my colleague to um, take a look at it and see if we could hold off and maybe shift this money someplace else where needed fire station or a more useful need in the community. That's all I'm asking uh, for. Thank you. Director Good, can you explain what this contract is? Give some background in terms of this contract. Sure. So this contract um, is to correctly refresh the berm that's on Miramar Parkway, uh, generally located between Flamingo Road and about 139th, 140th, somewhere around there. Um, this uh, berm has been in existence probably since that road has been built. Uh, we have experienced uh, lost material over the years uh, on that berm. Uh, 
The other thing that's uh, typical with berms is that uh, we're also losing the mulch line, which pretty soon we're not going to have any grass because the mulch line will have reached the bottom of the berm. So the uh, refreshing it would be uh, replacing some of the missing material, uh, bringing the mulch line back up to be just underneath the tree line, and to do some of the irrigation uh, repairs to make certain that we're irrigating all of the berm to keep it nice and green. Uh, this is a marquee uh, berm for uh, or a uh, view for us because it really is pretty much an entryway uh, to the city when you're coming off of 75. Uh, it, it, we want to keep the aesthetics in a very good shape because it does represent the city. It's a first impression coming off of 75. Commissioner Chambers. Um, from what I see in East Miramar, there's a lot of residents that lost their property to canal erosion. And this berm, maybe I'm wrong, but I don't see any. There's no homes right next door where they're losing property. I think we can come back and redo this at a later date. Um, I, I think we should really rethink this one and focus the money somewhere else that's really, really needed. So that's just my observation. And I'm hoping that uh, this day I can take a look at that. If you want to um, pull the item or vote on it tonight, I just think we should really focus this money someplace else. Thank you. Commissioner uh, Colburn. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, the city, the city also has another project, a beautification project, um, that's been talked about for some time, but it has not yet been implemented. To to beautify to uh, the beautification project is for the east side of Miramar, and it goes all the way, I believe, to 57th Avenue, and it includes Miramar Boulevard. Mm -hmm. um, on Miramar Boulevard. And university in particular um, there is an area that the city maintains that is really unsightly um, I do believe that's part of that project as well um, and I'm just wondering you know certain projects seems to take priority over others and I have not seen that beautification project uh, for the east side that has you know come come to fruition. So I'm just wondering if we can, you know, maybe combine this or, or when can we see that east side beautification project um, in place? Do you have a schedule as Commissioner Colburn um, raised the question um, of, of the, um, the master beautification project that um, I think that um, Commissioner Colburn is referring to? Uh, the answer is yes. Um, the larger beautification project, um, as Commissioner uh, Colborn had referenced, was uh, it does incorporate Miramar Parkway essentially from 64th Avenue uh, up to uh, Palm Avenue. Uh, it incorporates uh, Miramar Boulevard from University Drive to Palm Avenue. And then it incorporates a piece, a section of uh, 57th Avenue. Uh, we, had moved, uh, we had moved with a uh, consultant who had did a conceptual design for the city. And um, as we were going through the conceptual design, there was a concern that the, uh, that the impact of the landscaping may not have been uh, enough. And so, we were requested to review that and to come up with, see what else we can do to make that enhancement, uh, you know, have that powerful effect that was, uh, that's been anticipated. So uh, in that process, there were some other things that occurred. For instance, uh, several months back, uh, brought before this commission, we had a, a grant of $100,000 that was being provided to us by the state, FDOT. And we had to match that with an extra $100,000. And so we took the red road piece because that was the only piece that we could use uh, as part of that grant because red road is a state road. So state will not give you money unless it's on their roadway. So we accelerated that piece of that project. And that project 
what happened is it's got all design and when you go through the state it's a very tedious process because when you use state money they're very specific about how you use it so we had a project done and or design and we actually went out to bid and when we went out to bid it came back twice as much as what we anticipated we had a cost estimate of two hundred thousand dollars came back at four hundred thousand dollars so uh, we went back to the state saying uh, you know this is uh, a lot different than what we anticipated they said yes we didn't expect that either so we are now in the process of going back with the FDOT and through our consultants to uh, redefine how that project is to be let out because we understand that the hardscape components of that landscaping piece was a driving factor in the cost so we wanted to break that out and break it out just strictly with landscaping and, and strictly with hardscaping so you're going to see pretty soon it'll be out to bid again for uh, and, and, and we'll have it as alternates you know where landscape component of it the hardscape component of it so that way we hope to get a, a better response and get it within the budget because we only have two hundred thousand dollars but remember what say is only spending a hundred thousand dollars to that um, another uh, uh, thing that took place was that um, on Miramar Parkway between 64th Avenue and 68th Avenue there was a, um, a sort of a complete streets concept that was uh, presented to the MPO and as you're aware, Commissioner Colborn, we had submitted a TAP uh, application, which is a form of a grant, again, for, uh, through the MPO, uh, in order to receive money. And we were able to receive uh, close to a, a million dollars. I don't, I'm not certain of the exact numbers. But what happened is, is that us receiving those dollars now told us, well, we need to take this section out of the the scope of the beautification project we have because now it's a little bit different it's not just a landscaping plan it's a streetscape plan where you have bike lanes and curbs and gutters and and other kind of uh, elements that are to encourage a, a new form of, of uh, modal transportation so we had to take that piece out we are now back to the consultant saying okay well everything that's left now again Okay, we need you to come back and we need you to finish the design work for what's from 68th to, um, to uh, Palm Avenue and then, you know, the other piece on Miramar Boulevard. So we currently have uh, that process now back on track and so we're going to be presenting that piece of it as well uh, for consideration to move forward. So it's all working out. It's just very un a lot of moving parts in this uh, beautification process um, obviously because this process started about two years ago mm -hmm. so we're in two years in designing and for one reason or another we're taking out piece of it oh we don't have to do this because it's on another list but that list is not going to be going to take effect till 2018 2010 or whatever so we're just kind of moving it back rather than actually addressing the issues on the east side that it was intended to address. So um, I really would like to see that project move forward. Um, I, I, you know, I, I am puzzled, I, am, I remain puzzled that we would take out pieces of it. Um, and I think that's why you hear often uh, when you say people are saying, you know, they're not getting the attention on the east side. Um, you know, we have plans as, as, as a commission here. We have things that are set in place to happen. And, and I know we're doing a whole lot on the east side, and I know there are a lot of the east side is on the plans in all different areas. There are different things as well as the west side. But we continue to move things back or, or, or prioritize other things, and, and sometimes that is... is is what other people are seeing and thinking, oh, we're not doing enough on the east side. So I appreciate you explaining why this is, why it seems, why it seems that way, or why this project comes through before, before the rest of the project on the east side. But um, I do, I would like to see that project move forward. Thank you, Commissioner Colbert. Director Good. Um, in terms of some of the um, comments from Commissioner Colburn in, in, in regards to just some of the some, some of the sentiments, 
is the, I think when we communicate properly the, the plans, the expectations, the schedule of these projects that we can get to um, the community, it helps be able to put things into perspective. You know, in our meeting today, I covered this and discussed this um, with you because the first question I asked was, um, what's the status of the beautification projects on, on the east? So based on what you've stated, you're saying that had the city moved forward, and let's say, for example, did the beautification of the medians from 64th to 68th Street that shortly thereafter, because we have the complete street project, monies invested to put in brand new landscaping would have to be ripped up because the new complete because of the street project, the street improvement project. Is is that what you're saying? And that's why it was pulled out. I think that's what I heard. But is that what you were saying? The that section from 64th to 68th certainly would have received a modification. And certainly there would have been uh, some uh, removal and new installation. I don't know that it would have been every single thing, but I th it would have been an impact. And I don't know that um, we would have gotten, um, you would have spent dollars that would have probably not have been able to stay there for the duration. Okay. Um, so what that communicates to me is that instead of installing new landscaping that would be either completely or partially ripped up only to for new construction that it not necessarily the best use of dollars so i kind of understand that but getting to i to some of the points that commissioner colburn was stating is that um staff as the expert staff as the professionals that are dealing with our consultants to plan and schedule this you understand you see you know how the pieces fall into place but it stops there it has to be communicated to each of us on the commission then therefore also communicated to the residents so that residents can understand why things take place but um and, and I think that when we do that, it does, not, it does not fall into the narrative that not enough is being done to the East. Because I think residents, if they're communicated to, if they're shown when these projects are coming in, in, online, and if there are some circumstances that interrupts that plan schedule and it's communicated properly, I think residents will will understand reasonable re, you know circumstances. But when it's not communicated, then it continues. Or if we don't understand why it happens, then you get you know those those kind of comments. I only can speak for myself, but I just want to encourage us as a city to continue the efforts of ensuring that. The commission understands what's going on. The residents understands what's going on so that residents can really see that there is a tide turning in this city in terms of ensuring that emphasis gets put into the east, that resources get placed in the east, and they can have a level of expectation of when they're going to take place. Yes, Commissioner um, Chambers, and I'll entertain a motion if there are no other comments or questions on item have number two, seven. Two comment. Um, first, I want to ask that we don't deviate too much tonight from the item in front of us. And um, I want to say what bothered me with this item is that I live on the west side. I have to pass here to go home at night or day. And what I'm looking at here is that this project is going to be done with the CPI uh, money. So... I'm a little troubled that we're going to use fund that we borrow to do this small project. That's not, what? I don't want to say not necessary, but something that could wait. And um, I know for a fact that if we move this fund someplace else, um, we might be able to get this project done a lot cheaper. So that's just my concern, and I hope that we um, can move this item tonight. Thank you. What's the funding source for this project? 
I, I, this is a uh, general fund funding source out of this here. So this is coming from the general fund. This is not borrowed money. Yes, this was uh, approved at the. Um, this is approved in the budget process right. out of the general right. fund, part of the budget. Right. Okay, not associated with any bond or loan money, correct? Not okay, that I'm and just. Aware of, no. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a question. Yes. Was this project requested by by the community or or by? By a commissioner, or is it? How did it come to be? I, I believe that this project came up during the whole development of all the landscape uh, beautification uh, process and the concepts that were coming up. There was a lot of people that were asking for the enhancements, and depending, and then there was like the different funding sources, in which this one here was not a very expensive, considering the fact that the citywide landscape beautification is very expensive uh, so it was put on as a separate uh, track for improvements and so it was requested by that whole process for landscape beautification wherever all that information was coming to the Commission Com uh, Vice Mayor Riggs if <laughs> if the money is not used specifically for this project, are there any restrictions as to what it can be used for? I would defer that to the budgeting folks because uh, this would, if it's not used, it, it is a general fund. No restrictions. I, no restrictions. I uh, heard you. David Goldman, <laughs> Management and Budget. Um, there's no restrictions to, the, to these funds. It's general fund money. Thank you. Okay, um, we've kind of spent some time on this. Um, we've heard all of our comments. Um, um, city management is um, requesting approval for this item number seven. Um, I'll entertain a motion um, at this time. Motion to approve. I'll second. Call the roll. Commissioner Chambers? No. Commissioner Colburn? Yes. Vice Mayor Riggs? Yes. Mayor Massam. Yes. Um, item number eight. Item number eight is resolution of City Commission of City of Miramar Floor approving the award of invitation for bid number 16001 entitled Historic City of Miramar Drainage System Improvement Project Rebid Lot 2 to Landshore Enterprises LLC DBA Erosion Restoration LLC in amount not to exceed $213,337 and allocating a 10% construction contingency allowance of $21,334 for a total contract price of $234,671. Authorizing the city manager to execute an appropriate agreement with Landshore Enterprises LLC DBA Erosion Restoration LLC and providing for an effective date. Okay, um, I, I pulled this item. I'm not sure if anyone else um, pulled it, but um, the reason why I pulled this item, um, it's kind of a double-edged sword. This is a blessing that we're finally about to begin some canal stabilization. Um, and, and I've always supported, I've always supported um, the narrative that I believe the city should take, and that is, you know, one Miramar and not putting any neighborhood against um, uh, another neighborhood because we're all one city. And, um, and as this is moving forward, I had the question in regards to um, the, there's, in the Miramar Park homeowners group have been a champion in regards to sounding the alarm of degraded stormwater management systems um, um, in our city, um, and particularly in their community, even though there are other communities that also have, or neighborhoods that have canals um, that have some, have significant erosion. And, um, and my, I know that I just want staff to be able to explain why this project is coming even though, um, first before in the efforts in regards to why the first set of projects aren't starting in the Miramar Park Homeowners Association because I think um, they deserve um, um, explanation in terms of the, the, the sequence of events and when will up the next phase begin in, in their community. Um, I'd like to give the presentation, and it would probably yes. answer all the all the questions that you yes. have. Okay. 
Okay. So we are asking for approval to this company, Lands, uh, Landshore Enterprises, to do erosion restoration work in uh, the Miramar community for $234,000. So Public Works is obviously responsible for lakes and canals that are owned by the city. Um, several years ago, a feasibility and needs study was done by a company called R.J. Behar and Associates. And they investigated uh, most of the, all the canals and the lakes that the city owned between University Drive and 441. And the study then focused on the conditions of these embankments uh, and trying to tell us, you know, basically what, what, what needs to be done to arrest the problem. So here's a picture of the canal and lake systems that were inspected and evaluated. So I want you to look at system number one. This is the upper right. It's a very small canal system. Uh, that has a discharge into Miramar Parkway, and it has a transmission pipe that takes it basically to the canal system that runs along the Florida Turnpike. Canal system two serves Miramar Isles community, and it's a rather large system. And I want to point that it has only one single exit point to get out, and that is underneath County Line Road um, on the bottom of uh, the System 2 graph. So there's only one discharge point. And then when you get to System 3, this is the Miramar Park Group, and this Miramar uh, Park uh, Group here has three discharge points, actually. It has two discharge points that are on your left side there, which is uh, discharges into the University Drive Canal, and then it has another discharge point by the turnpike down in the bottom right corner of that, uh, of that turn. So the results, there were, you know, all the homes on those lakes and canal systems were inspected. And they were identified as having, as being good condition, meaning they had very little problems or they were in medium condition, meaning that they're starting to show signs of wear and deterioration. And then there are poor conditions where, you know, you really got problems now and you really need to have something addressed, you know, as quickly as possible. So we want to just show you quickly, these are actual pictures of some of the of homes on these lakes and canal systems. And some have seawalls and some don't have seawalls, but you can see the ones with the seawalls have, you know, they look fine. They're not falling down yet or anything. And then the ones that don't have seawall, they have relatively good slope. Uh, there's a good piece of property between the lake and the, and the foundation of the home. And then we get into some of the more, the medium condition ones, where you can start seeing some failures. They haven't had complete failures yet, but they're starting there, right? And then you also have conditions where the erosion is starting to eat itself Close enough, it doesn't show really, but some of these homes are really, it, it gets quite close to the foundation. And then you have poor conditions where you have total failure of the either seawall or some of the fabricated seawalls that were put in place to try to stop the erosion. And some are just substantial. This one uh, on the right, you can see that it's like right at the foundation of, of the patio, which is typically just a couple feet off the foundation of the home base itself. So there were a lot of uh, uh, solutions that were evaluated, uh, you know, being put in all seawalls or put in what they call rip wrap, a bunch of rock or gable gants, this, that, the other. And we've come up with a solution that's called geotubes. And what it is is that uh, there's they're like these geotextile fabric socks that lay on the canal, and then you uh, fill them with the sediment from the canal. So you actually get a dual purpose. Uh, process here, which is one is you restore the embankment, two, you also get to take the sediments out of the canal, and you're actually restoring uh, the water quality of the canal system. Uh, again, uh, go ahead. So, just try to give you a visual of what geotube application is. And the one picture on the left, this is an empty sock or uh, geotextile fabric uh, unit. And what they do is they, you know, have holes in them and things, and they can take a pipe, as you see on the right, and they have divers going in the water, and they got this big pump, slurry pump, and it just starts pumping 
all of the sediments up into the sock and they move it along and, and it just, they start filling it and filling it and filling it. Okay, and it stays contained. And you can see on the right picture, they anchor it to uh, the existing uh, canal, or, uh, canal embankment. So this is just a picture showing you what happens, what it looks like when they're fully filled and they're dried out. Uh, the picture on the left is, uh, you know, just like it is raw. And the picture on the right, what they do then is they put in dirt. And once they put the dirt on, they'll lay the sod back on, and it'll look like grass all the way down to the canal bank. And these are some kinds of uh, the conditions. The, the one on the left shows you, you know, this was a seawall. You know, everybody wondering how could this stuff work with a seawall. Well, on the right, you see what they do with seawalls. And this actually is a very good solution when you have failing seawalls because you don't have to remove the seawalls. You could put these socks, they form, and you can stuff them underneath the, 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 you know, the, the seawall and then stuff it on top of the seawall and just kind of locks everything in. And then, again, you, know, you just fill it up until you can fill it with dirt inside. Again, this was uh, that same issue where they just went over top the seawall. Now, you don't even know there was a seawall there. All right? So we uh, are talking about funding. This is a really compli you know, this is not complicated, but it's the, it's the limiting factor for us being able to do a lot of this work because every, you know, this takes money. So uh, there was $550,000 currently, there is $550,000 currently available for this project. $300 of it was in bond money. $250,000 was through a state appropriation that we received last year. Um, we thought we had enough money to take care of all the poor condition. We were looking at some prices around uh, the county, uh, some of the you know, work that was being done like in Coconut Creek and uh, we even had some work done ourselves in really, really small areas here in the city. Um, we thought we had enough money. So we went out and we did a, a bid for all 119. And we were very surprised when we only got one bid back. And not only was did we get one bid back, it was like nearly eight times the amount of money that we actually had to do the work. So we asked these contractors, you know, what, you know, why did you not bid, you know, I mean, we knew a lot of people got the information, but they were concerned about the fact 119 in a single project and the fact that it had to be bonded and the fact that we had to give, we had given a time frame in order for them to get it done uh, caused them some concern and they didn't want to bid on it. And so we said, fine. Um, what we did was then we said, okay, let's make it a smaller project then. Let's take 119 and break them up into what we call lots, and maybe it's better to say groups of like 10, 12, 15, whatever made sense, depending on where all those locations were. And so uh, we were hoping to get, uh, you know, lower, lower, you know, the, um, you know, try to get within our budget and then try to get a greater participation, more participation, more competition, hopefully better prices. And so we did. Uh, we got some. We got better. Some lower prices, but they were still a little bit expensive. And so what happened? Um, we just said, okay, well, let's go out with two groups in this one drainage district, which was, excuse me, drainage system, which was system two. And if you recall, I showed you system two only had a single point of of exit, which caused us greatest concern because it was the most at risk. Because if you block that discharge point off you got the entire community that has no ability to get rid of floodwaters. So um, trying to put all this together with the fact that we have, we have limited funds and um, you know, how did we go about you know, choosing a sequence and what we're going to do as we go further. So we, we broke all these areas down. Remember I told you 119 areas. We broke them down into all these eight areas here. Okay. And we said, well, let's go ahead and try to work these um, uh, areas that make sense. So area one, as you see on the bottom right, is what this particular item is making specific reference to. This is the area that we're working in first because it's, you know, the proximity to that discharge point to get out to, to uh, Dade County. Area two is over in the Miramar uh, Park community you know, close to that one uh, exit point by the turnpike again, but we have two other uh, discharge points out at the University Park, 
but we're currently, and we're trying to kind of do this uh, quickly. Uh, you know, we got to start somewhere, and we're not going to wait until Area 1 gets done before we start Area 2, because Area 2 is already in process, where you're going to be seeing here soon, or within the next 60 to 90 days, we're going to have another agenda item for you asking you to allow us to move forward with Area 2, because we're working on that contract to do that. So uh, then after we get done with Area 2, we're going to go back to Area 3, you know, work in that, you know, critical area again, then go to Area 4, which is back in the Miramar Park group, and then Area 5, we're going to take care of that little group up there, because we need to take care of them still. 6 will be back into the Miramar Park group, 7 will finish off the Miramar Isles group, and then 8. Now, all this, of course, is contingent upon funding. So we right now are spending $250,000 in Area 1. We have $300,000 more. We're moving into Area 2. Whatever monies we have left, we're going to go into Area 3. And we anticipate in the future we're going to continue to be receiving monies in order to be able to continue this project. But it ain't going to be done in a year, you know, to get everything done. It is a multiple-year project, and we know that. So we went through uh, the procurement process for air, for. Area one, again, I just want to, you know, we went to Demand Star, uh, we had a pre-bid conference, and again, we still only received two bids, uh, but the bids, we, we did tabulate them. Uh, Lakeshore was the lowest for group two of the bid, and we know that this contractor is a qualified Broward County Enterprise firm. And this is how uh, the award uh, came out. We had group one, group two, uh, Landshore, and shoreline and the reason why we only gave out group two again because if you see if we combine group one and group two at this part with this particular contract we would not have had uh, substantial enough money because we would have been over budget and like I said we're working on another contract that we have lower prices that we're going to be able to get in uh, we'll get area two done so we are on this contract because it was our bid we are going out with uh, group two only and we believe uh, one of the most important things for us and the reason why we're trying to really move this along is because we're using the state fund for this group one for this award. Uh, it's very, very important that we start moving this project along because of the fact that come at the end of 2016, uh, the state will say, well, whatever money you got left, give it back to us. So we need to, we're gonna, we need to spend this money and so we didn't want to delay anything more and, and get this done. All right. So here's just some examples of the locations that we are actually going to be uh, performing the work at. So this just is 3815, another one, uh, Emerald Lake Drive. Those are just a couple of the 12 or 13 that we're doing. And so we believe that this is really, really important project. We all know it is because the most important asset for us right now, uh, you know, in this community is the ability to do uh, stormwater management. If we lose our ability to do stormwater management, then we're going to be, you know, seriously in more trouble. So it's a very, very important ac asset to us for the, these bodies of water, and we believe that it'll also, you know, restore some of the properties, you know, bring back, you know, retain the property values as well. And one of the most important things is why we got the state money is because we're also looking to do a water quality improvement in that canal mm -hmm. system. So staff and city manager is making recommendation for approval. Thank you, Mr. Goodfell, for the presentation. Um, this item is very um, important to me because this was when I was first elected in 2011 in talking with residents, which happened to be the Miramar Park Homeowners Group. Um, that was the main issue that was very important to them. And um, this item was on the consent agenda, which probably would have passed with, you know, with, um, with the consent of the commission, and then work would have started. And then neighbors, no neighbors, and I just thought that it was, um, again, one of the communication issues in terms of explaining the process and the sequence of how things will, will transpire. So um, I know I'm, I don't want to beat a dead horse, but I just want to emphasize that communication from staff regarding these important issues, when we know, it's been countless of presentations that staff has done with community organizations regarding embankment restoration. So um, again, staff feels 
great. We got a part of it going. Progress is being made. However, there's a disconnect with the community. So it's very important that we continue to stay, you know, connected with the community so they can understand. And, and those members in the audience that have seen the presentation now have a level of assurance that when their neighborhood will be addressed and again that they're not being placed necessarily you know on the back burner so um, thanks for that uh, comprehensive explanation any other comments um, commissioner Colburn and commissioner chamber working our way down thank you mr. mayor um, I pulled this item as well um, one because it is very dear to me it is an important item um, it's an item that I've had extensive conversation with staff on um, and it's also an item that I did want the public to know that it is happening because it is something that's important in our community that's, and it hasn't been addressed in this form uh, to my knowledge. It, this is probably the first time that it, uh, lake erosion has been addressed at least in the last five or ten years or so um, that I've seen anyway. Um, especially on the east side. Um, but it is something that, it is a problem that's experienced throughout the city. It's not just the lakes that the city maintains, it's also the lakes that are, the canals that are responsibility of South Broward Drainage District. And I'm really happy to see that our city is taking care of the canals that they are responsible and assisting with lake erosion. Um, I would really like to see South Broward Drainage District do the same with the other lakes in our cities where our residents are also experiencing similar problems with uh, erosion of their properties. Um, and we've, we've talked about this. Um, so my question to you is, you speak about state appropriation, state funding. Is this funding that we can also that we can also get as a city for lakes that we're not maintaining, or is it funding that the South Broward Drainage uh, District can also get so that they can assist residents who have similar pro erosion problems? The um, state appropriation uh, that we received is specific for the city and the city-owned uh, assets. So we couldn't do anything. That's when you not say state, state appropriation, is it a grant? Is it a loan? What are we referring? What are you referring to? It's uh, every year when the when the state legislation goes into session, you have your projects you request to have considered in their uh, appropriation process. Uh, when they're doing their budget, and that's what I meant by state appropriation. So uh, to answer the second part of the question, certainly the South Broward Drainage District is uh, eligible to apply for those uh, appropriated funds as well, just as, as any other uh, state-sanctioned government agency could. What do we need to do as a city to to get the South Broward Drainage District to act upon that? Make the request. We need to make a yeah. request? To the Executive Director of the South Broward Drainage District. Okay. Um, is this okay with this commission? I would really like your, um, your, your agreement so that we can, we can ask a city manager to, to pursue that and work with South Broward Drainage District so that they can also you know, do the same thing, seek these appropriations, seek money from the state so that they can address the other lakes throughout the city as well. I think we have consensus from the dais to, to seek uh, those funding options and um, the city manager can report back to us in terms of the specific um, request. Okay. Yeah, I appreciate that. Again, this is, this is a great project. I'm really happy to see that this is happening in our city and I look forward to the others coming forward and into South Broward drainage district stepping up as well. Thank you. Thank right. you. Thanks, Commissioner Colburn. Yeah, Commissioner Chambers and Vice Mayor Riggs. First, let me state a correction. Um, the record reflect that Commissioner Chambers was the one who pulled this item first. Um, 
Mr. Good, I when I first came on board in March, I think April, I went out and met with quite a few residents no, 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 was complaining no, 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 about no, no, um, <laughs> erosion. And I forwarded you a list of some residents, and I know you met with me, and at the time we couldn't get the money to get it going, so if you went out and seek this. I want to thank you so much. Well, let me ask you real quick. Uh, I don't want to take too much time. Uh, you know the property out there. Uh, how much does it cost to do one property, like one resident home? It's five bucks, twenty bucks, just just a number. Well, what what this current uh, bid is approximately fifteen to twenty thousand dollars per home. Fifteen and we're to twenty. To try to even reduce that even more. Okay. There goes my point. I don't want to drag this on, but we got six to five thousand dollars here, and let's say twenty thousand dollars to do one home. So we could have added that sixty-five to this two hundred and thirty-four. We could have done three more homes. Um, that's my point. Thank you. I'm Vice Mayor Riggs. Once this is approved, what's the length of time for completion for lot two? Uh, I believe that the uh, contractor has indicated that it would take them approximately two weeks per home to do the fundamental work, which would be to put the, the bags in and to stack them in an appropriate way. And then I'm, it would take them a little bit more time to come back in and put the dirt in the side back down on and top of that. So if, if I had to guess, because the, the schedule is not quite so uh, clear cut, but if, if you wanted me per home, how much time it would take, I would say three to four weeks per home. And this includes 19 homes, if I'm correct, right? Excuse me? Is it 19 homes in lot uh, two? No, I, I believe it's 13, if I'm 13? not mistaken. Right. Okay. Thank you. Well, again, thanks, staff, for this is years of work, years of work coming together and, um, and putting solutions together instead of just, you know, when not being able to do 119 all at once, but continuing to move the process forward. You know, we, we finally can say that we are getting work going on. And, and as I said earlier today in, in our meeting earlier today, that um, at least from my involvement since 2011, we've been going, um, having meetings after meetings, getting the community together to come up with some uniformity and the solution, knowing that it's hard to get the community to to settle on a decision to come up with, you know, this method, you know, with the support of the community and the involvement of the community. So um, we're definitely excited that this project is moving forward and, um, and we'll continue to communicate with the residents in terms of as the project continues to progress, um, what, what um, homes will be um, dealt with next. So um, at this time, I'll entertain a motion to approve. Second. Call the roll. Commissioner Chambers. Yes. Commissioner Colburn. Yes. Vice Mayor Riggs. Yes. Mayor Messam. Yes, item number nine. Item number nine is a resolution of the City Commission, City of Miramar, Florida, approving the second renewal of the landscaping, irrigation, maintenance, and litter control services agreements with Prestige Property Maintenance, Inc. In amount in an annual amount of $424,948 and Landscape Service Professionals, Inc. in an amount increased amount of $214,052 for a combined annual amount of $639,000 for the one-year period commencing on February 28, 2016, authorizing the city manager to execute appropriate renewal agreements and providing for an effective date. Who pulled this item? Commissioner Chambers, do you need a presentation or you have questions? Um, I don't want a long presentation. I think we're going to go home tonight. Um, so real quick, just in a few words, I just want to you to explain to the listening audience and people at home. Um, just real short and quick, Mr. Good. Thank you. So this item here is to do a renewal. Thomas Good, Public Works Director, sorry. This item is to do a renewal for our uh, landscape services. Uh, we're going to be doing uh, two companies. Uh, we're renewing with uh, Prestige, and uh, we're renewing with Landscape Services. So Prestige is uh, being awarded. Oh, let's see. All right. 
Prestige will be uh, re re uh, awarded uh, $425,000, and Landscape Services will be awarded $214,000. And pretty much the services here uh, are required for them to, what we call, say, mow, blow, and go, uh, cut the grass, uh, uh, trim the trees at least once a year, uh, pesticides, uh, fertilization, and uh, they do have uh, litter control responsibility as well on the areas that they're uh, designated for uh, service. Okay. I'm going to be okay with this item, and uh, I just want to state that next in a year when we go out, we're going to try to look for a better deal. But I'm okay approving this item tonight. Thank you. Can I have a motion to approve? Motion, motion. To, motion, motion to, to approve. approve. Second. Call the roll. Commissioner Chambers? Yes. Commissioner Colburn? Yes. Vice Mayor Riggs? Yes. Mayor Massam? Yes. Thank you. Item number 10. Item number 10 is a resolution of the City Commission, City of Miramar, Florida, approving an additional services fee for Walters Zakaria Associates PLLC for additional design services for the Adult Daycare Center in an amount not to exceed $70,632, authorizing the City Manager to execute a First Amendment to the existing project authorization agreement providing for an effective date. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Vice Mayor, Commissioners, Luisa Milan, Construction and Facilities Management Director. Would you prefer a presentation, yeah. or do you have questions? Yes. Um, I don't need a presentation, okay. but I just have a question. Um, my concern with this item is, is this an additional design fee from what I'm seeing? This fee is to compensate the consultant that originally did the design work for changes to the original scope. He was contracted for a specific size facility, mm -hmm. and during the design process and based on the needs of the um, facility, it increased, so he's due um, that additional payment for the additional work that he performed. Okay. Um, what's the square footage of this building? It right what? now is uh, 3,800 um, net, meaning mm -hmm. air-conditioned space. It's mm -hmm. about 5,300 gross. I just want my resident to know that this was a bad deal from the beginning, and it's not your fault. And I, I hope we can make some changes in how we negotiate um, this contract, um, because this number is really way overpriced in terms of the design fee for 5,300 square foot or 3,800. So that's just my concern. I, I think it's really, really out of whack. And, um, it's something that we're going to have to take a look at here as a city um, for our resident. And so I'm, I'm going to be voting against this item, not because I disagree with the project, but because of my concern with the money that we're spending. I just want you to be aware of that. So it, it's, it's a concern to me. Thank you. Are there any questions? If not, um, entertain a motion for... Motion on the item. Motion to approve. Second. Call the roll. Commissioner Chambers. No. Commissioner Colburn. Yes. Vice Mayor Riggs. Yes. Mayor Massam. Yes. Item number 11, please. Item number 11 is a resolution of City Commission, City of Miramar, Florida, approving an additional services fee for CPZ Architects, Inc., for additional design services for the amphitheater at Miramar Regional Park, an amount not to exceed $91,622, authorizing the city manager to execute a second amendment to the existing project authorization agreement for an effective date. Once again, I, my, I'm sorry. my same concern, uh, to me, price gouging, so I can't fix this right now. I just want my resident to be aware of, we've been overcharged, so um, I'm out. Commissioner Colburn. Yeah, I just had a question. Um, on the second page of the memorandum, it talks about an award of $377,000 from Broward County Tourism Grant. And I don't recall that coming before us. Is that something that's, because it was, seems like it was recently approved in November. Is that going to come before us? I don't recall us ever announcing that to the residents. That's why. Is, is that something that comes back to us? I do, I do recall us doing an application for approving an application for it some time ago uh, I will defer that question to Mr. Hardgray he's more informed on that subject okay Mayor 
City Manager, Commissioner Vernon Hungry, um, Operations Manager. Um, we applied for a grant with the Broward Tourism, and in November, late November, we got news that it was approved okay. for three hundred and seventy-seven thousand dollars. In that process, what we have to do is we have to sign an agreement with them. Um, I talked with the grant administrator as well as Earl Boss with the director uh, probably about two days ago in here and he told me that they were trying to do two other or three other projects, the grants application together, and that's the only reason that they have failed back. But it has been approved by the county. We, ha we will have the money. It's just a process of us signing an agreement. Okay. Well, it's a good thing. I mean, if we if the city receives a grant for three hundred and seventy-seven thousand, it's it's a good thing. I didn't re I didn't recall it being announced, or I didn't receive mm -hmm. anything on it. So I just I just wanted to bring that out. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Colburn. Um, there was a, a a comment regarding to price gouging. Can you explain? Um, the reason for this item and this cause. Louisa Mian, Construction Facilities Management Director. Um, the reason that we're paying these additional services to the consultant is, a, is based on the result of the GMP. In other words, the, the original design for this project went out to bid. It came in way over bid and we could not afford it. So we went out as a guaranteed maximum price contract and we selected in the commission approved that selection. We sat down at the table, negotiated with that selected contractor as well as with the architect of record, the one here, CPC Architects, and we valued engineered that project to meet what the city commission approved, with, which is the $5.7 million project. As a result, those original drawings need to be revised in order for us to obtain a building permit. And that is what we're paying this consultant for, to rede not redesign so much as to revise the documents to reflect what is part of the 5.7 bid in the new scope. What was the original? The original the bid that came in was $9 million. Um, right now, we awarded it at 5.7, including the canopy, which was not part of the original bid. So meeting the desires of the commission in terms of, and we don't have to rehash history in regards to the political football process that took place with the passage of the amphitheater, as well as directive from this commission to repurpose um, bond monies and bringing the project in line. Um, was also a contributing factor in terms of the scope of work, moving it to make it within the commission directive. That's correct. So instead of being um, faced with a $9 million cost bid, the design revisions to bring the project within, within line with the desires of the commission um, is the result of this, of, of this additional cost. That's correct. Mr. Now, will we have to go to the general fund to fund this? How will this be paid for? This is being paid out of the uh, revenue bond. And in terms of the, the grant funding, what will be the use for the grant funding towards this project? The $377,000 that we received from the Broward Tourism um, will be utilized to pay these additional fees. The remaining balance will be used to um, add new permanent restrooms throughout the park that will service the amphitheater as well as other park activities. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Chambers. Um, this, this can be quite simple, but we choose to make this thing complicated for our residents. Um, the process that we use here is very flawed. Let's say, for instance, in, in the public, someone want to build a, a facility like that, and they go out and solicit a bid from a, the four or five different contractors, uh, or the architect, they gave a, a price, and the price per square foot usually somewhere between 
two or five percent, and which is reasonable. Now, for the city, we're coming in at maybe 10, 12 percent because we set the numbers before we go out for bid. That's how it works here. So, once we set that number, the contractor already know the numbers that we set, so they work within that number. So if you're buying a car that worth twenty thousand dollars and they're selling it to you for nine million dollars, it's overpriced to begin with. So if there's a fee attached to that nine million dollars, it's gonna increase from what the fee for the twenty thousand dollars would be. I don't know if I'm explaining it right, but that's pretty much what it is. When I have more time, I'll explain it to my resident. This is overpriced, bottom line. I don't know if somebody else who want to break it down can break it down more simple than I am, but it's just the way I see that. Anyone in this business, me as a cabinet maker, had some sense as to the industry, the trade, how it work. I, I kind of familiar myself with the costs when it comes to designing. So this is a designing cost and change order. It's it's. Ridiculous, ridiculously overpriced. Am I going to vote for the item? No. But it is what it is at this point. I just want to be clear on that. So everybody know where I stand with this issue of being overpriced. Thank you so much. Well, I'll break it down and I'll explain it. As a certified general contractor of the state of Florida who understands and has the experience as a commercial builder, Whenever a contractor is bidding for work, there will no a public entity's planned or proposed budget for a capital project. But because it's a competitive environment, if I rely on the owner's budget costs, I could be potentially outbid or I could put myself in peril because the design documents and specifications could cost much more than the owner's proposed budget. You don't know what your competitors are going to bid. The project came in at $9 million on the initial bid. Staff did the process to reduce scope to remove design elements from the amphitheater to make the project more affordable to the tune of the bringing the project down four million dollars less with working with the construction manager value engineering elements which remove the permanent restroom remove back of house structure which brought us to more affordable price that we have now. To make that possible, the construction manager needs construction documents to be able to build this new scope. To get the design documents, the new design documents, the design consultant had to make revisions to the prior designed work which is what we are proving tonight. Now, what I do have an issue with is the contract that the city has with some of these architectural consultants in terms of fees being paid based on the bid price. We should have a negotiated CCNA laws in the state of Florida allows for professional consultants to negotiate with public entities in a fair manner to pay for services rendered. And our design, our design our architectural contracts with our design consultants needs to be revisited and not have compensation tied to the bid price that contractors will bid on those drawings. It should be negotiated, their, 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 their fees, their construction administration costs for oversight of the project should all be negotiated and should be independent of whatever contractors bid so that you get more competitive pricing. And that would be the recommendation that I would suggest 
for staff and the city attorney because the city attorneys are also involved in this process so that we are also making sure that we are in this, putting the city in the best position to get the most competitive pricing. But, um, but to add perspective on the process, this was a long process. The amphitheater should already be open by now. But because staff responding to the old commission and now the new commission, those decisions have cost implications. You can't just make a decision and all of a sudden change your mind and want something else and then now when it comes back and then now there's a bill and we're saying there's, there's an issue. Decisions we make have consequences. So, and that has nothing against the comments that have made prior. I don't necessarily disagree in terms of any of my colleagues understanding of this process. I'm only voicing my understanding of the process. Um, so I want to make that clear. And I think um, staff, given the circumstances in which you've had to make decisions in terms of ensuring that staff is delivering the intent of the commission, I think you've done an exceptional job in terms of bringing the cost down for this project and putting it in a position so that it can move forward. And, um, and I applaud your efforts in terms of what you've had to go through over the last two years to get us to where we are today. And the area of opportunity that I would recommend is that we change the architectural contract um, or the consultant contract, design consultant contract between architect professionals or professional services and the city and make compensation independent of the bid price and not a percentage tied to the bid price. Thank you. All right, one final comment, we'll move this item forward. Commissioner Chambers, you're recognized. Um, Mr. Lewis, correct me if I'm wrong. I just want to explain to some of my residents who probably only gone to Sunday school like I am. Um, this um, design fee is only for the blueprint and the change of design. That doesn't have anything to do with construction itself. Am I correct? That's correct. It's right. only to modify the, con the contract documents to reflect what the bid price includes. Right. So I'm right. This is just for the yes. design and the blueprint. Yes. Uh, Right? For the for the change for the change right the change in the blueprint let's call it the blueprint a lot of people are familiar with the design okay. or the right it's not doesn't blueprint have, and specifications right specifications yes. thank you as design contracts tied with the bid price of the of the contract as it was um, is is the design work tied to the percentage of the bid cost of the project. Correct. No. As explained, because that's what was told to me today, that the, especially for item number, for the adult daycare. For that, the adult daycare, yes, but okay. not for this one. Okay. So for the additional work. So consistent with the scope of work change, changes because of the cost mm -hmm. for the project was a direct result of bringing the cost of the project down, removing the, the amphitheater was basically stripped of many elements to bring the cost down, and we're paying for the additional cost for that additional work. Yes. But our boilerplate design contract for most of the work prior to you coming to the city of Myanmar, the compensation for design consultants are tied to the bid price. A lot of the contracts are, yes, the old contracts. We yes. are looking, we, we started to evaluate how the contracts were written, and we've been working with the city attorney's office, and we're trying to draft a brand new agreement that will be a standard agreement. It's not based on percentage of design fee, based on, on bid price. So but our current contract does. Um, not all of them, but the majority of them were that way. Not anymore. We don't do that. We negotiate each and every contract with the consultant based on the scope of services that we're requesting. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, you, you, you're a general contractor, right? 
Sir? We're, um, Commissioner Chambers, um, I, I would no, ask I'm that if it's, a, if, it's a, if, it's a, if it's an issue de um, related to the, to the support or rejection of this item that you direct your questions regarding to that item. I won't entertain personal questions. I was just asking that, just explain this very simple so that the people could understand what we're paying for. That's all I'm asking. Instead of taking it into a direction to make it complicated, it's, it's, it's pretty straightforward. And we have a flawed system here for, for a long time. So we're going to have to do something about fixing that. And I'm not, I know you're standing there, it's not about you. I'm not, you know, it's just the system and the money and the way I see it. And it's, I'm, I'm correct. So, um, I think I'm going to. Can I entertain a motion from this item, please? Motion to approve. Second. Call the roll. Commissioner Chambers? No. Commissioner Colburn? Yes. Vice Mayor Riggs? Yes. Mayor Massam? Yes. Item number 12, please. Item 12 is a resolution of City Commission, City Member of Florida, announcing support for Florida State Senator Maria Sachs's Senate Bill 904, SB 904, and providing an effective date. Um. No, I, may I? Um, Vice Mayor Riggs, please. I pull that item. Just a quick comment, um, especially seeing that it's 945 <laughs> and we're only on number 12. So I just wanted to show my support for this item. It is extremely important to me because I've had some personal experience with family and friends being, um, you know, a victim of bicyclist fatality. So this is even as a registered nurse in the emergency room, seeing so many victims based on something that is so preventable. So I'm glad to see this happening. You kind of beat me to it. So <laughs> um, full support. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Commissioner Colburn? Yes, thank you. Um, yes, I'm happy to see that this is being looked at at, at the state level as well. Mm -hmm. And um, I am supporting this item as well. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Colburn. Um, I pulled this item because um, I was wondering why it's on the agenda, and I know the mayor is going to speak on it, but I'm just going to ask it to be brief if you're going to speak on this item. Thank you. <laughs> I'm so glad we're a family. I'm so glad. It is 9.45. <laughs> I'm losing my voice. <laughs> oh, obviously, in the legislative process, it's always good to get local support on statewide issues. And our senator, uh, Maria, one of one of our state senators, Maria Sachs, is um, presenting a bill to the state legislature, which will um, um, require um, um, design requirements in our roadways for um, safe bicycle um, usage and traffic. Um, so um, we have many bicyclists here in this community. Um, when I'm on my many jogs and runs on the road, I even violate their space in the bike lanes when running because the asphalt is just better than concrete. But, when, but this will say that the city of Myanmar supports this item. And if passed, then it will require um, 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 engineers to incorporate these elements in our roadways so that our, so streets would be safer for bicyclists. So um, is the reason why um, for it to be approved by this commission. Um, and at this time, I'll entertain a motion for approval. Motion to approve. Second. Call the roll, please. Commissioner Chambers? Yes. Commissioner Colburn? Yes. Vice Mayor Riggs? Yes. Mayor Massam? Yes. Item number 13, please. Item 13 is Resolution City Commission of City Mayor of Florida amending the Qualified Target Industry Incentive for Project Blade, providing for local financial support in the form of cash in an amount not to exceed $27,000 and funding an effective date. Who pulled this item? Commissioner Chamber. Yeah. Please be brief, sir. Uh. <laughs> I will. <laughs> this is a, it's a good item, and I pulled it because um, I just want a brief explanation from my resident as to what we're doing here. Just be simple, quick. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Madam Vice Mayor, Commissioners. This item is a qualified target industries incentive project for a company called Project Blade. The company is in the city already, 
They're going to be expanding their operation by purchasing equipment valued at over $4 million and creating 27 new jobs in the city. So this is part of the state incentive program and the city is participating. And I have Thank a motion, you. please. Motion to approve. Second. Second. Call the roll. Commissioner Chambers. Yes. Commissioner Colburn. Yes. Vice Mayor Riggs. Yes. Mayor Massa. Yes. Okay. Item number 15. Item 15. 14. Nope. No, 14, 14 is consent, consent has already passed. Um, item number 15, please. Item 15 is resolution of City Commission, City of Miramar, Florida, authorizing the signing and submission of a grant application to the Florida Department of Transportation for federal grant program funds and acceptance of funds and associated match requirements if the grant is awarded and providing an effective date. Good evening. Good evening. Mr. Mayor, Madam Vice Mayor, Commissioners, City Manager, and members of the dais, and Justine Hu, Assistant Director of Social Services. Happy to be presenting item number 5959 for the approval of section 5310 enhanced mobility grant application for funding. The federal government allocates funds each year for the Section 5310 program. The Florida Department of Transportation is designated to administer the program. Eligible expenses include capital expense for which we are applying. And this includes items such as buses and paratransit services. The city is applying to FDOT for funding and if awarded, recommends the purchase of a bus to replace city bus number 521. Since its acquisition, bus number 521 has logged over 216,000 miles and has developed several mechanical problems that often made it inoperable. The bus proposed for purchase is a 29-foot Ford Entourage with a seating capacity of 20 with two wheelchair positions. So a total of 24 seats without wheelchairs. The vendor, Getaway Bus LLC, is a registered vendor with an active contract through the FDOT TRIPS program to provide vehicles under the Section 5310 program. The total cost of the bus is $111,199. The city match of 10% will be $11,120. The funds for the 10% match will be budgeted in the Public Works Fleet Vehicle Purchase Account. Public notice was published on December 15th. The public comment period was December 15th to January 25th of this year, and tonight's hearing, January 27th, 2016. No comments have been received to date. Any comments received at tonight's public hearing would be documented and forwarded to the FDOT. And approval is recommended. Thank you. Are there any members from the public who wish to speak on this item? Seeing none, bringing it back to the dais. Um, are there any questions or entertain a motion for approval? Um, just a comment. Commissioner um, Colburn. This has, this has been a very good grant for, the, for our city. Um, I remember when we, first, um, when we first started to replace buses with it, um, it's actually one that I had recommended the city to apply for. And um, it's just been a, it's been a great grant, and we have been able to get it every year. Is that for the past three years? So, I hope we do get it again this year to continue to improve our fleet for our seniors. <laughs> uh, if you like, I'd make a motion to approve. See another comment? So I'll entertain a motion. Motion to approve. Second. Call the roll. Commissioner Chambers. <laughs> yes. Commissioner Colburn. Yes. Vice Mayor Riggs. Yes. Mayor Massam. Yes. Item number 16, please. Item 16 is an ordinance of City Commission of City of Miramar, Florida, amending Chapter 11 business taxes, permits, and business regulations of the Miramar Code of Ordinances by repealing Section 11 33, interview and investigation of receipt applicants, duties, fee to defray cost of criminal history form, receipt questionnaire form, Section 11 34, grounds for denial, Section 11 35, appeal from den denial of receipt, and Section 11 36, revocation of receipt. To eliminate the process of background checks for new businesses as part of the business tax receipt application process and providing an effective date. Good evening, Honorable Mayor, Vice Mayor, members of the Commission, Barbara Hastings, Assistant Finance Director. This is the second reading for Temporary Ordinance 1624. There were no changes from the first reading, so if there are no questions, uh, we would like to request um, approval. Yes, are there any comments from the public on this item? This is the second reading. Seeing none, I'm bringing back to this dais. If there aren't any questions, I entertain a motion. 
Motion to approve. Second. Call the roll. Commissioner Chambers? Yes. Commissioner Colburn? Yes. Vice Mayor Riggs? Yes. Mayor Massam? Yes. Item number 17. Item number 17 is an ordinance of the City Commission of the City of Miramar, Florida, creating a new chapter of the Land Development Code entitled Chapter 1 Authority, rescinding existing Chapter 1, <coughs> Purpose and Applicability, and Chapter 3, Review Agencies, including the City Commission, Planning and Zoning Board, Development Review Committee, and Community Parents Board, adopting a new chapter of the Land Development Code, providing for applicability, title, and authority, providing that the existing zoning map shall continue in effect, adopting provisions related to interpretation and replacement of the zoning map, providing for the creation of an operative provisions relating to the City Commission, Planning and Zoning Board, Development Review Committee, and Community Appearance Board, and amending portions of Chapter 4, Comprehensive Plan relating to Application Procedures, Amendment Procedures, and Grammar in Chapter 8, Section 813, Community Appearance Board, renumbering and relettering provisions, providing for severability, providing for inclusion in the code, and providing for an effective date. Thank you, Mr. Albert. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Madam Vice Mayor, Commissioners, City Manager, City Attorney, City Clerk, Michael Albert, Principal Planner. There were no changes requested at first reading. Uh, staff recommends approval. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Um, are there any questions from the public on this item? Seeing none, bringing it back to the dais. Are there any questions? I'll entertain a motion. Motion to approve. Second. Call the roll. Commissioner Chambers? Yes. Commissioner Colburn? Yes. Vice Mayor Riggs? Yes. Mayor Massam? Yes. Item number 18. Item 18 is an ordinance of the City Commission of the City of Merrill, Florida, amending the Land Development Code, making findings, amending Chapter 5, Development Review Procedures, revising Section 505 relating to temporary uses and structures, amending Section 508.14 relating to certificates of level of service compliance for parks and recreational areas, amending Chapter 7 use regulations, re revising Section 705 relating to commercial zoning districts, requirements and section 706 industrial zoning district requirements revising grammar and certain catch lines revising uses standards and requirements revising section 713 relating to specific use regulations repealing section 713.6 relating to child care centers and section 713.14 relating to restaurants revising section 713.19 relating to fuel service stations with mini markets convenience stores providing accessory use standards amending section 713.21 Places of Assembly in 713.22, Pain Management Clinics, Revising Grammar, Amending Section 715, Relating to Transit-Oriented Corridor Districts, Amending Development Incentives, Amending Section 715.3.3, Relating to Landscape Standards, Providing New Standards for Tree Planters, Planting Strips, Median Trees, and Street Trees, Revising Section 713.3.7, Relating to Development Standards in Special District 3, Community Facilities, Revising Graphics and Tables Displayed in Section 715.4.0 in the Transit-Oriented Corridor District, amending Section 809.9 .9, relating to gazebos and pergolas, amending Section 809.13 relating to utility sheds, revising Section 809.17 regulations and including regulation of patios on fee simple multifamily lots, amending Section 809.18 to include regulation of walkways on multifamily lots, providing for severability, providing for intent, inclusion in the code, providing for interpretation, and providing for an effective date. Mr. Albert. Mr. Mayor, I'm sure um, our attorney loves that very long title. <laughs> um, changes requested regarding the hotel regulations at first reading. Uh, staff recommended relaxing the requirements for hotels to provide a minimum of 250 rooms, a full service restaurant, and conference space to seat at least 350 people at tables, which is comparable to 4,000 square feet of space. Staff was asked to develop some code incentives to encourage hotels to provide conference space, and so therefore staff is proposing to allow reduced setbacks and landscaping requirements, as well as additional height for hotels that provide the conference space. Staff recommends approval of these changes. Are there any comments from the public on this item? Seeing none, coming back to this dais. Um, any comments or any questions? I'll entertain a motion for Motion to approve. Second. Call the roll. Commissioner Chambers? Yes. Commissioner Colburn? Yes. Vice Mayor Riggs? Yes. Mayor Massam? Yes. I'm quasi judicial public hearing. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Florida courts have determined that there are certain types of matters, including the following applications, which are to be treated differently than other issues considered by the Commission. Most decisions of the Commission are legislative in nature, which means that the Commission is acting as a policy-making body. 
In contrast, in quasi-judicial matters, the Commission is applying existing rules and policies to a factual situation and is therefore acting like a judge or a jury in a courtroom. In such cases, courts have decided that due process of fundamental fairness requires that more formal procedures be followed. The City of Miramar's procedures for quasi-judicial hearings are as follows. Anyone who wishes to speak shall be collectively sworn in by the City Clerk. The hearing shall be conducted in an informal manner. I will read the title of the items to be considered. City staff will present a brief synopsis of the application and make a recommendation. Next will be a presentation by the applicant. The Commission will then hear from participants and in favor of and in opposition to the application. All witnesses are subject to cross-examination by the City staff, City Commission, and the applicant, and a participant may request that the Commission ask questions of a witness. The applicant and staff will make concluding remarks. No further presentations or testimony will be permitted, and the public hearing will then be closed. All decisions of the Commission must be based upon competent substantial evidence presented to it at the hearing. All backup materials provided to the City Commission as part of the agenda will automatically be made a part of the record at the hearing. All approvals will be subject to staff recommended conditions unless otherwise stated in the motion for approval. These rules will apply to item 19 on this evening's agenda, and at this time the City Clerk should swear in any witnesses. All of those wishing to provide testimony on the following quasi-judicial items, please stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the, but the truth? Thank you. You may be seated. Um, item 19 is a resolution of the City Commission of the City of Miramar, Florida, concerning an application for extension of site plan approval for Sunset Lakes Center, located at the northeast corner of Miramar Parkway and Southwest 186th Avenue, and providing an effective date. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Madam Vice Mayor, Commissioners, Eric Silva, Community Economic Development Director. Sunset Lake Center Site Plan Extension. The applicant requests a third 12-month extension to the site plan approval for the Sunset Lake Shopping Center. The site plan was originally approved in 2012. Last January, they were granted a second one-year extension. The property is located at the corner of Southwest 136th Avenue and Miramar Parkway. This is the site plan that was approved in 2012, and you'll notice that the site had two access points, one on Memorial Parkway and one on Southwest 186th Avenue. The site plan includes a daycare and a small retail shopping center. The architecture of the project has the Mediterranean style, and you can see the daycare there with the colorful sign and the shopping center to the left. Staff's recommendation is for approval with two conditions, that all applicable state and federal permits shall be obtained before commen commencement of development, and that the site plan approval remains consistent with resolutions 12-146 and 12-147. Staff has recommended approval of this extension at this time because the property owner has been negotiating with two adjacent property owners for access to the property. This has been going on for several, several years. Um, they're negotiating with the Sunset Lakes HOA and then a church to the north. And the applicant is here today for a brief presentation. Good evening, Alicia Lewis, 200 East Broward Boulevard, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, on behalf of the applicant. I have a brief presentation just to explain what has brought us to this third request today to extend our site plan. And if you can go to the third slide, I believe. So um, Mr. Silva has already explained um, our site plan and, and our previous request. Um, I'm sorry, the next slide. So the reason for um, our request today is based solely off of an access easement. And an easement essentially is the right to use someone else's property for a very specific purpose. And as you can see, the area highlighted in red is the property that's currently owned by my client. And they've had this... Th They've had a site plan approved for um, this property to be developed. However, if you look to the next slide, um, parcel P2, and excuse the typo, is owned by Calvary um, Fellowship Church. And parcel P2 and the parcel owned by my client were previously parcel P, which was owned by one owner. And the access that you see at the very bottom of my client's property, if you go to the next slide, that access that you see between the red and the yellow area, that's right in only. So it's ingress only access, meaning you can only come into that portion of the site. And so because the site is now divided in half, we don't have 
egress. We don't have exit, an exit essentially from our property. And so initially when we had our NVA, NVAL amendment approved, we requested to negotiate with the Sunset Lakes HOA to give us access along 186th Avenue. And so if you look at the red portion, that's what Sunset Lakes HOA essentially owns. It's a landscape easement and, a, and they, continue, they own it. And so our request was to have another access to give us egress access through that portion um, highlighted in red along 186th Avenue. Um, we negotiated for several years and it's been approximately six years since our very first conversation with them to request um, access through that um, area and we've essentially gotten nowhere. Um, so then our next position was to negotiate with what we have which is a um, easement by right um, through the area that's currently owned by Sunset, not Sunset Lakes, excuse me, area currently owned by Calvary. And so by requesting that um, and negotiating with them, we went over 11 different offers back and forth, um, and we reached an impasse at the end of last year. And after reaching that impasse, we did file a lawsuit um, to be granted our implied easement, which would be through Calvary's property. And so that's brought us to you all today because our site plan would expire if we did not um, provide this addi additional request to you. And um, other than that, I'll be glad to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Um, are there any questions from the dais? Yes. Okay. Yes, I'm Commissioner Colburn. Thank you. Recognize. You recognize. Um, if we extend this, what what do you expect to happen? Well, the the lawsuit was initially filed in August of, of last year, so August of 2015. Um, motions have been filed back and forth, and hopefully, our goal is to have this resolved and settled. Um, prior to needing an additional extension. But, you know, we can't guarantee that. We've tried for six years to negotiate something between the neighboring HOA and with Calvary. And so our goal would be to, you know, have this settled and not have to have an additional request. But because it's in the midst of litigation, we can't necessarily guarantee that. Okay. Um, I, I know this has been going on for a very long time. I know, I think initially there was approval yes. um, from um, Sunset, Lake, Sunset Lakes HOA, but there's been a change in the, the board, and it's just been a very um, difficult um, process in, in terms of um, getting that approval. So um, um, it's, I'm, regardless of whoever owns this property, it, the, the property is, 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 is ready for development. And no matter who owns this pro property and whoever has a conforming development um, to go there, this issue um, is, is going to persist until there's a, you know, a, a solution, solution to it. Um, um, so um, what has been the last communication with Sunset Lakes? Um, I believe the last communication with Sunset Lakes was in August of 2015. Um, we reached out. They have a new attorney that's representing their HOA board, and we reached out to that attorney, and they still did not want to meet with us. With us, We've tried on several occasions to have meetings and present our requests and negotiate with them, but there has yet to be an actual meeting to take place, and they voted and have denied um, granting us the easement. Did, did they state why they would not grant they, did, they, they stated that they believed that it would be a traffic increase, um, and we wanted to give a presentation to explain that because we do essentially have an approved site plan, meaning that we have um, satisfied the city's requirements in order to develop the site. And so we wanted the opportunity to explain that to them, but we were not given that opportunity. Okay. Um, if there are any more questions from the dais, are there any <laughs> comments or questions from the public regarding this item? Seeing none, um, bringing it back um, to the dais. Um, I don't, I don't see a problem in extending it, allowing their process to to try to move forward. Um, because I mean, they've met all the city's requirements. It's um, an issue between private entities trying to get a resolution. So to deny the extension, I think, would be counterproductive towards getting the end goal to getting the property um, developed so that there can be a civil resolution to this issue. So, um, I agree. I just have a question. What is the downside to not approve it? What is the harm to the company or to the development in general? Can someone else be trying to get it developed if, if it 
it was not for this. I mean, what? And this is for staff as well, not mm -hmm. not just. Mm. So es essentially, if this was not extended, if our site plan wasn't extended, we would have to reapply to the city um, to have our site plan approved, which would incur additional fees to um, my client, and it would also create another process that we'd have to go through to basically do Same what thing. we would do today if we extended it. Mm -hmm. We just pay you a fee in order to do it, and we're in how the midst much of litigation. How much additional <laughs> fees are we looking at? What's what's the cost? That that would be a question for staff. <coughs> Michael Albert, Principal Planner. Uh, the fee is based on a uh, base fee for commercial and then the square footage calculation. I believe it's 16,000 square feet. Um, it, it would be somewhere in the range of $8,000 plus the community appearance fee to reapply for a site plan and CAB approval. But that doesn't include the cost of doing the drawings from the applicant's team of architects and engineers. Yeah. So by by the city continuing to extend this uh, to this group, does it does it keep other groups from trying to develop it or anyone else? Well, whether this applicant develops this property or not, the next person, the next company that comes here to try to develop something has the same issue. There's only one way in out of this, out of this property, no way out per the plat requirements. The plat note to excuse me the non-vehicular access line has to be approved by Broward County to allow a uh, right turn in in and out of the property and that's what they were proposing on 186th Avenue so this if they don't if this applicant doesn't achieve this it'll still remain a problem for the next applicant yeah the, the, they, um, they, they own the the owner owns the land they've it would be counterproductive to pay another fee to for the city to re-examine what they've already examined and have already approved. Um, there's just an unfortunate situation. They're kind of like landlocked, so to speak. So, so they control the land. They control the property. They've presented a site plan on what their intent is to build on that, to develop the site. They've met every requirement. They've done everything the city has required to move forward to get this property developed. The issue is meeting the requirement for ingress and egress. They only have one so far on, on 86, and they're trying to get it off of Miramar Parkway, and now they're going, uh, you know, I guess, access by right with the property owner to the north, which is, you know, which, which is, which is a church. So, um, so as I stated earlier, I think in terms of the item that's before us to extend it, because they've done their due diligence, they've met all of our requirements, they've it gone through exhaustive process to try to get the pro other parties um, consent to move forward that I think it would be counterproductive to our spirit of encouraging development in our community to deny it and then they have to come back to do this you know again because if they get fed up throw their hands up walk away sell it guess what someone else is going to buy it they're going to propose a new site plan and they're going to have this very same issue and then our city is going to put a timeline for them to get it developed and we'll be right back to where we are well, uh, we, uh, Commissioner Chambers then Commissioner Cole um, I think the problem with this item was quite established in the backup agenda it was well laid out so um, I don't have a problem approving this item I want to move forward um, we have um, we have we approved an extension several times on this already. Is that correct? This will be the I think that's the third the third extension. This yes. is the third time we we're extending on it. Okay, um, I I will approve I will approve this tonight. But um, I I am a little concerned that we continue to to extend this and, and set a precedent. And, and possibly just getting involved in, in something private. You know, I don't want it to cost uh, the developers another $8,000 or whatever. Um, you know, it, that's a substantial amount of money. So I don't, I, you know, I, I do hear you concerning the cost. But I, I am a little concerned that we continue to, to approve this and set a precedent on it. But I, I do, I will go forward and approve it tonight. But I, I hope that it will be taken care of, it will be settled in court before it comes back to us. I, I will note that I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, 
one variance or one difference between this extension and the other is that I'm not sure if you had already engaged conversation with the property to the north. It was more so because of the dormant communication between yourself and HOA from Miramar Parkway. So, so it is a new scenario. So what I would say is that even though this would be the third extension, at every point, at every step of the way, this applicant has been very active in terms of moving the process forward in circumstances that they don't necessarily control. So I think it, in, in a way, would be kind of unfair to the applicant that has invested in our city, has met all of our requirements, but it's private parties. So all this will do is allow private parties to come to the solution. They are engaging the property to the north, and hopefully perhaps that engagement will solve itself and it won't have to come back, but I don't want them to be necessarily um, 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 put in a negative or seen in a negative position because they've been moving the ball forward and they've been very progressive and very proactive in terms to getting this settled. Um, Again, we have, you know, I am sympathetic to the, to the, to the developer, to the group. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd like to see it. I would like to see that develop. Um, you know, so I will go forward with it. But, um, and they are, they are doing things to try to make it happen. But I am concerned about a setting precedent to, to continue to extend it so many times. So, mm -hmm. you know, I would have more concern another time <laughs> if it comes back. Uh, one, one final comment, I'll entertain a motion. Commissioner Chambers. Um, I don't think we're setting a pre precedent here. Mr. Alpart, can you come to the microphone, please? From my understanding, this property right out here where we built those apartment. We had extended for n numerous times that property over the period of time during the recession. Am I correct? At, at the town center? Which, which I'm sorry, which Just apartment? Just behind the um, parking garage, all that new complex that was built. Um, with the previous owner okay. that owned the property, we were extending and extending. Are you referring to the town center property? Here. I don't know what's the name of it, but... Yeah. The parking garage right here? Yes, yes. All those home um, apartments. There, there was there. a different developer that I know, had I plans know. approved for um, the townhomes and apartments, and because of the recession, they ended up not building it. And in 2012, a new developer was approved, and they, they were the ones that implemented but the before construction. Before we were here. given extension. In no, they, they, weren't, they didn't have an extension. I'm not sure what it is. Okay. There was something that was given. Hector Vasquez, Strategic Development Officer. Commissioner Chambers, you are correct. Um, there was an extension that was granted. Right. Only one. Of course. Yes. So, this, okay. this is not a precedent. I know there was something going on, and we had to. I'm done. Can I entertain a motion? Uh, well, wait yep. a second. Wait, let, wait. Me, let me just <laughs> let me get a clarification. All right. Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. In terms of the extensions, because I would like to know whether or not this is something that we routinely do in terms of giving out three extensions or so forth. Um, Ch Mr. Uh, Commissioner Chambers is saying that you know this wouldn't be a precedent that you know. So is this something that we do all the time? Do we do three and four extensions, or or is it you know is it uh, is it different here? Sure. I just want to apologize that what was extended was a development agreement, not the site plan approval. I'm sorry for the right. for the ones here at the it's, town center, which is a different item. It's a different but item. It's very similar. Right. Um, we've had over the past. 15 or 20 years, a handful of uh, extension requests. There haven't been that many. Um, Multiple for one location? There was, um, there was another one that had three, okay. and there was another one that had two. Uh, most of them were extended ones. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. These Thank you. Come All right, can we, can we move this item Mo forward in terms, terms of, in, in terms of the, we, we, we can't go tit for tat on every issue. The issue is we've heard the case. The, owner, the, the property owner wants an extension so they can complete their litigation scenario. We have a motion on the floor. There's no motion. Is there a motion? Yes. Motion to approve. Do I have a second? second. Thank you. Call the roll, please. Commissioner Chambers? Yes. Commissioner Colburn? Yes. Vice Mayor Riggs? Yes. Mayor Masson? Yes. Other business? All right. Commission reports. I'll start this time with Vice Mayor Riggs moving down. Excellent. Thank you. 
First, I want to say thank you to staff for meeting with me over the holiday and giving me a tour of all the different departments. I really appreciate that, and thank you for your hard work. And um, second, I want to announce my first annual health fair coming up um, February 13th, Saturday, February 13th, from 11 a.m. till 3 p.m. I'm in partnership with Care Community Center to put this event together, and um, it will be on Pembroke Road and 64th. And there will be services from blood pressure check, mammogram check, HIV testing, and we're also targeting the pediatric population with um, dental check, vision check, um, immunization. So I want to also thank our sponsors like Memorial. Thank you so much for partnering with me to do this. Um, Aetna, Publix, um, Colgate. So there are quite a few companies who are coming together to provide the community with um, information and um, supplies to keep themselves healthy. So I'm very happy about that. Um, one more thing, we're not meeting until probably what the third or fourth week of February. So I want to remind everybody that February is Black History Month. So join me in honoring all of those throughout our history who have made a lasting impact on our lives. Thank you so much. Commissioner Chambers, you're recognized. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I want to clear up some things right here. Um, before I start pointing in the finger, I want to make sure my hands is clean. So i got to wash them. Uh, I just want to state that my office had some issue with staff and um, things was not being done or getting done properly. And since I um, was aware of the issue, I've dealt with it and took care of uh, my issue in my office. So um, I just want to be clear on that and take full responsibility for whatever was not done or done in my office for, with my staff. Uh, just want to be clear on that so, so I can get that out of the way, okay? Um, this issue that comes up here tonight with these residents, um, I think this is something, I, I, I'm kind of glad that they came in and dealt with it here, but we have to fix this thing. It's been going on for too long, and I know it can be fixed, so I, I'm not sure how we're going to get together, if we're going to have a meeting or uh, executive session, whatever, but I, I really want to get this solved. I know we can fix it. It's not that hard. It, it's been just um, kicking down the road, so we need to fix that. Um, next issue, um, I would just want to say many thanks to Chief Ray Black and his wife, June. They've been a lovely uh, couple and a gift to our community. I thank them for their service and their work here. And I, I just can't express my gratitude uh, to Mr. Chief Black and his wife, June. Um, also, uh, staff for the city, they've been tremendously great for the city. Um, game, um, water, public works, the tremendous job, fire, police, just all around. Everybody do a good job to keep the city going, and I want to thank them so much. Um, and I know it's a new year, and this is our first meeting back. I just want to welcome everyone back. Um, even though we've been back at work since the new year, uh, I know everyone had a good Christmas and good new year. I just want to thank you all so much for what you do here. And, um, I don't want to go on too long, but I know Universal Circus is in town once more, and um, they reach out to me, and they're doing a senior day on February 3rd. It's a Wednesday, and it's a 10.30 a.m. show. I'm trying to encourage everyone that's available at home to come on out. The code word is Commissioner Chambers, and you will get in for 10 bucks. You don't have to come in a group of 20 like they said before. Um, people could show up in the video and just mention my name and you pay 10 bucks to get in. I'll save the rest for later. Thank you so much. Is that a savings, uh, Commissioner Chambers? Or? <laughs> it is a savings. Uh, you know, I, I know the price range from 18 to 30 something, so it, it is a big saving. And it, it, this is not limited to the senior kids, adult. I know your home, so. Commissioner Colburn, you recognize. Thank you. Uh, I like to say Happy New Year's to everyone. Happy New Year. Um, it's good to be back here, starting a 2016 year, seeing everybody um, refreshed. Oh, they're still refreshed after tonight. 
Um, there are a couple of things that I, I would like for staff to follow up on, if I can get consensus of that as well. There were two things that were mentioned tonight by residents. Um, one is a 2% charge uh, for payments that's, that was said it's a double charge. Uh, I would like to see a report on that. If I can get consensus, I would like uh, to ask the city manager uh, to give us a report as to why is it being said that it's a double charge? Unless she has an explanation tonight that you would like to share. I can only guess, because um, she mentioned that it was part of the budget, that when we did budget projections, we did talk about the fact that um, we don't recoup the cost for processing of, uh, of credit cards. And so the city has been eating that cost for 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 always. And so now, similar to other municipality, other agencies, uh, when we process uh, cards, we're going to uh, charge, pass that cost on to the person who issues the card, and that way the city will not uh, lose money by, by by using credit cards. So it, it, it was part of the uh, of the revenue projections that was in the in the budget. When it was, you say it was part of the revenue projections. Was it part of any other increase? Was it already considered or included as part of any other increase that that was approved? I'm not that I can recall. I just know that uh, we knew that it was time for us to start looking at how to not let the city um, absorb the cost of processing credit cards. And the 2% is only for credit cards? As far as I know, yes, because you can pay cash, you can pay checks, or you can pay uh, electronically, and there were no, no, no additional charges for that. Okay, and we are getting information out to the resident as, we, as to how this process works. We have it on the website. We, um, have, we were going to do the, um, the water bills. Um, we were using different methods to get the information out. It's campaign for it. Okay. Yeah, on, before you go on, Commissioner Colburn, I think when we were presented this initially, I think um, my recollection was that um, it's viewed more like a convenience fee. Like, for example, if, if we have revenue projections for whatever city service that we're providing, by, by paying by credit card, actually those revenue projections are actually not accurate because it doesn't take into account the 2% or whatever that merchant exactly. fee is to process that credit card because it's going to cost us to process the credit card. I think um, based on the marketing plan or the, 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 the I guess the, the, the public notification of the payment options for um, residents is that there is multiple options to pay. Um, that don't incur that cost. If it's by cash, or if it's by check, or if it's by electronic check, um, there's no additional cost, and those options can be taken. And if it is, however, a credit card payment, because the city is charged the fee, they're just pass, they're just passing that fee on to 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 the residents. So that's my understanding of it, how it was presented. Um, okay. And I, I do want to make sure that this is this is like a pass through. It is something that's being charged to us. Uh, this two percent is being charged for because of the credit card and therefore that's, we're passing it on yeah, to that's correct. to yeah. the individuals who's you who are using a credit card. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, the other concern that was brought up tonight as well and it is a concern of mine is the public safety substation. Um, I believe that when the police headquarters was originally approved, that at the same time it was said that there would be, there would be a construction of a substation on the east side and that it would be done simultaneously. If that's, that's my recollection and if it's that is correct. I see the police chief taking his head. <laughs> um, now, our police headquarters is, is almost open. Um, that's coming within the next couple of months, uh, next few months. And we haven't been presented a design for the police substation on the east side. So I, I, and I know there have been some changes. Um, 
Mr. Mayor, if you give me an opportunity. I know there have been some changes in the plans, and this goes back to what I was saying uh, earlier with the landscaping project as well. You know, you could, we continue to approve things, and then there are changes, and it seems to have an impact. And oftentimes, it's on the same area. <laughs> in these two particular cases, it is. Uh, so I am asking to to really look at the police substation and bring something back to us concrete as to what is it we're going to do because that's a commitment that this commission or previous commission made to the, to the residents of this city and it's going to be hard at this point to fulfill that commitment since the police headquarters are almost ready but we need to give them something. We need to give them some dates. We need to be very specific as to what is it we're doing there. So I am looking forward and I am asking again for consensus for the manager to bring something back to us uh, specifically on the substation because it needs to be prioritized. I will go ahead and mention to you that the substation was is um, at this point one of those projects, if you recall during the summer, during the budget processes, we mentioned that we were going to do reprogramming of, pro of uh, some of the projects. And that one is tied to the, uh, the project that they had for the storage facility <coughs> and the, um, what's the uh, property, the property room that was going to be here. So part of that delay is related to the fact that we're still working out the details as to what we can bring over to this facility and then not have to do the construction at the, or if we're going to still have to do construction at, that's at the utility plant and then what will eventually come to the, uh, sub, to the substation. But the process, the program is not, it's delayed because we want to do the right thing. Um, but it is going to happen. It was a commitment. We do intend to keep it. I will get you the report. That's, I, a, that's I, not an issue. And in more so than a report, I just want to say that I'm really asking for it to happen. <laughs> Let me be clear. We, we really need to. We need. We need to be good on that commitment that we made to the residents, and we need to show them that we that we have made a commitment. I know staff is working on it. I know staff has is, is, is looked at it in different ways and. Um, but the residents do not know this. The residents need to understand what is it we're doing specifically as far as it pertains to the substation, and more importantly, we need to have a substation out on the east side. Again, I will emphasize communication. It's communication, communication, communication. When changes are being proposed or made, this commission has to know so we can communicate to the residents because when you don't, questions start flaring in the community and there's no explanation for it. So we understand circumstances come up. We understand program needs arise, but we have to communicate it um, to the residents. So um, Commissioner Cope. Right. Um, so. Um, one other thing I wanted to say, one of the, um, a good thing that happened um, uh, back in December um, is that the federal government, um, for the first time, approved um, a five-year, a first time since 2005, a five-year bill with $281 billion in funding for transportation highways and mass transit and and it's a good thing. There are a lot of needs. We have a lot of needs here in the city of Miramar pertaining to that. And um, I know we have our lobbyists that are following up on that, and MPO has your lobbyists that is following up on that. And um, as, as far as that is concerned, one of the things that I've asked, I've met with the city manager and I've asked uh, her and staff to follow up on is to make sure that we have a transportation plan so that when, when monies do become available like this and, and, other, and other monies from the state as well, that all our needs are identified, not just our needs for today, but our, ne our future needs, so that we have, we have items that we can bring to the table for our residents. And that's it for me. 
Thank you, I'm Commissioner Colburn. I'm gonna try to wrap mine up in five minutes, so keep clock. Update, um, yesterday I attended the Broward County um, Commission meeting um, because one of their public hearing um, items, items number one, um, an item um, sponsored by Commissioner um, Beam Fur um, for the for Broward County to um, to basically put a moratorium or to prohibit the use of fracking to extract oil in Broward County. Um, I went there because that's con because it's consistent with the resolution of the city of Miramar when we were opposing the Cantor um, real estate. Um, state permit to drill oil right outside of our city, um, I went in support of that item. Um, the reason I bring this up tonight is because just on Monday, there was a state Senate bill that was passed that basically would nullify the passage of yesterday's decision to, about, to, uh, to make fracking illegal in Broward County. The state has legislation right now that threatens home rule for local governments to protect our natural resources. And the saving grace, though, however, is that our potential saving grace is that because of Broward County's zoning, um, there may be some defenses in terms of any applicants being able to have the ability to to drill oil, they still have to come to Broward County for for um, a zoning um, approval for that. But there's a lot of talk. If this bill at the state um, passes, that it could potentially be challenged, and that was one of the main reasons we um, that um, that we raised as a city that we could potentially be facing a situation where there is going to be a big legal battle in terms of. Um, oil operations in Broward County. And we just can't rest on current laws to protect us. We have to keep this issue up. We have to keep the public informed about the progress of what's going on. Because just as, because there were some comments that were made that, well, it'll never pass in Broward County. But yet, there's active legislation right now in this session that will threaten to abolish our ability to protect our natural resources. So we cannot let this issue die. We have to I'll continue to give updates to the city in regards to the progression of legislation as well as progression of the current application that is looking to um, seek oil because we may think it's not possible, but we can't sleep on this issue. Second, we don't have to discuss this tonight, but in prior meetings, I raised the issue regarding um, banning the box in the city of Myanmar to abolish the question of asking if someone has been arrested when they apply for a job because it discriminates against those who have paid their debt to society to even be considered. It does not stop the process of background checks and all of that, but we don't want to say no to someone just because they may have been arrested in the past because people are rehabilitated and just because they may have had a minor offense in the past, it doesn't necessarily mean that they can't be a great asset to this city. So I want to ensure that we're not being a roadblock just in our application process to prevent especially residents of Myanmar who wish to work or anyone who wish to work with our city that couldn't be an asset to our city. I think I have two minutes left. Three, um, we need to decide on a, our, finalize our commission retreat date. We're coming up on budgeting and what direction does this city administration have? We have to have this retreat to begin to talk about the process of our visioning, where we want to take this city to the next level. We have to have this discussion. That's our responsibility. So we need to set this date very quickly. Uh, we've been kind of pushing it along, so we need to get, I know there's a poll that's gonna be going out. When we get the poll, please, let's respond. And when we send the poll, let's give like one or two date options. And we just lock it in and we get it done. And we need to get that done as soon as possible because staff needs direction on how to move forward with the city. And it'll definitely be an asset in terms of the budget process. All right, um, the second item, is 
the marijuana, Broward County's marijuana ordinance. It's countywide. Does it work for Miramar? Are we going to opt in? Are we going to opt out? If we opt out, how do we still maintain those benefits? We haven't had that discussion. We need to know. I said one issue that I had personally was that um, the ordinance as written, because Broward County allows flexibility for each municipality to enforce the laws, um, it gives a discretion if law enforcement will make an arrest or issue a citation for that person who has the small amounts of marijuana, you know. I think that we should not necessarily give that option, that it should go up to the least chief level or our administrative level for that because who's to say when an officer stops someone on the street that their judgment, that they let this person off but don't let the next person off? What circumstances? It shouldn't be subjective. It should be if it's a small amount, if we're going to do the citation, we do the citation. If we're not, we're not going to do it, but we need to determine when that needs to be an item that we need to have a workshop on quickly to decide. Because I, I think there's a cutoff date if we're going to opt in or opt out, or there's been an extension. I noticed it was, they've, they've extended it. Okay, because I thought there was a, a, they pulled it out. Okay, because I know when it was passed, there was a, we had to, it was a date certain, each municipality had to respond if they were going to opt in or opt out. Okay, finally, um, New Year's Day Funk Fest, we had um, a um, Funk Fest came to the city of Myanmar and it exceeded everyone's expectation to the point where it was easily 10, 11,000 that showed up for um, the event, which shows at a minimum that there's that the Miramar Park is a desirable, regional park is a desirable location to have entertainment events. And these are just quickly, you can just quickly go through some of the, the photos from, from the event that took place. And there's a lot of potential in terms of um, festivals, um, other concerts of different genres, whether it's rock and roll, funk, reggae, you know, R&B, gospel, whatever the case may be, uh, salsa, you know, um, um, merengue, or whatever, whatever um, um, genre of music, it's, a, it, it's definitely a, a destination. Um, six, I do want to um, give kudos to our Miramar Cultural Center and our staff in regards to the current President Barack Obama exhibit. We had a community event on the 20th. Um, which was well attended, and and if you haven't seen that exhibit, um, it's 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 a very moving exhibit in terms of the photos for the, the the president and key moments during his administration, and it'll be here through February. I know we are, there's a lot of schools planning trips, community organizations are coming in to see um, the exhibit. Here are some photos of um, from from that night. Um, many of the elected officials that are here tonight, I think, um, were um, also present. And, um, and during my comments at the, 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 the event, I thought I mentioned um, Kamasha DeVoe's name when I was saying that there was an employee that, in, that came up with the idea um, uh, for this exhibit. And I, um, I failed to do that. And I wanted to publicly recognize her for conceiving the idea. And I know our staff at the Cultural Center did a lot of work as well. Um, um, Ms. Armstead and some, and everyone knows who was a part of it. Our OMPR office that helped as well with the with the marketing did a, a, a very great, a very good job with, um, you know, um, with this with this exhibit. And um, and, and thanks for your um, attention to detail as well as the very professional work um, that was done while with the exhibit. And again, it'll be here until the end of Black History Month. And I definitely encourage you to um, notify the residents and residents to come on out um, to take a look at the exhibit. You have to go to Washington, D.C. or some Smithsonian Museum to see, these, to see this work. It's the president's official photographer, Pete Sosa. So why have a trip to D.C. when you can come right here to City Hall to see this great work? 
Um, as Commissioner mentioned, um, Chambers mentioned early Universal Circus will be here from February 3rd to February 15th at our regional park. You can visit universalcircus.com. You can get the hookup by on that night from Commissioner Chambers for Seniors Night, but you can also go on other nights. I know um, Universal Circus has informed me that they're having a Greek night, they're having a spirit night, they're having a Caribbean night. Um, they're having so many different themed nights to get the community involved. And finally, and I know I went over my five minutes by three, um, I do want to recognize two of our very own. Um, um, Natasha Hampton and Allison Smith were recognized by Legacy Magazine as 25 um, most powerful black women in South Florida. And... Um, in fact, they will be recognized right here at the Miramar Cultural Center on February 13th. And um, you can, if you would like to go to the reception or the event, I think there may be tickets available for sale, but I think you, you can just search um, Legacy Magazine to get more information. But I did want to publicly recognize two of our very own for being recognized for the work that they do in the South Florida community, and kudos and congratulations. And hand clap. <laughs> And unless there's any comments from the attorney or the manager. I have yes. two. Uh, yes. Well, excuse me a second. Okay. Well, talking about recognition, um, did you complete a, a marathon recently? Yes, Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you want to give us some feedback on that? <laughs> well, um, it was very tough. I, I did my very first marathon on Sunday, the Miami Marathon. It was unseasonably cold. It was, the race started at 6 o'clock. It was 45 degrees with wind chills in the upper 30s. But the thing is, I survived. I survived. <laughs> and I do want to thank the community, however, because I did receive a lot of encouragement right here in City Hall on social media. And um, thanks for the encouragement. That's off the bucket list. And um, who knows? There may be another one, but... Thanks so much. Congratulations to you. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay. Madam um, Manager. I need to announce that on Monday, the firefighters from Station 107 will be moving out of the cramped quarters over in the logistics office to their temporary trailers. They're ready for, finally for them to be occupied. <laughs> I know it's been a long time. It's really been a long time. So uh, they'll be moving on Monday. Uh, and then secondly, I would like to introduce formally uh, Norman Mason, who is our Director of Management and Budget. Norman, you stand, please, so people can see you. Um, Norm came to us in December, and um, December 7th, and he's going to serve as the Department of Capacity um, as the, the Director for Budget and Management. So you get a lot of time and, and, and um, experience with him in the days to come. Um, he, can, he, works, he comes with a wealth of experience in the fields of budget management, operations, planning, and training. Accredited among his many talents are the design and implementation of capital expenditure models, the development of the finance for non-finance managers program, in addition to providing training on these models and programs to senior management personnel. Um, Mr. Mason has proven experience in budget development, portfolio management, long-range planning, financial management, and fiscal oversight, all of which we're looking forward to experiencing. So join me, please, in welcoming Norm Mason to the Miramar family. No disrespect, Dexter. <laughs> um, there was a memo that was issued at effective this, um, December 14th. December, January? December? January. January 14th. That's, that, it felt like it's been longer. <laughs> um, with the departure of Chief Ray Black, Dexter is the interim chief, a uh, police chief, and um, we're going to be working to finalize a process in the near, in the near future. So Dexter is the chief. I was saving it for a more formal uh, event. I didn't want to do it on the same night, but that's okay. You squeaked in there. <laughs> <laughs> on that note, this meeting is adjourned.
ladies, because I'm a guy, I had to sing it like that. Unconditionally. Don't worry about that. You do your thing. Take it an octave up. You still give me love, ladies. Unconditionally. Just like this. Yes. Just like you do it. One more time. Can I hear you loud and clear? You still give 